22, stalked by Numa. Nkima spent a night of terror. Shieta, the leopard, prowled on the ground, climbed through the trees. Nkima clung to the loftiest branch that would support his weight and shivered from cold and terror throughout the long night. But at last day dawned, and with the first lessening of the terrifying darkness he swung off through the trees in search of Tarzan and the Waziri. And still he clung to the little cleft stick with the bit of paper fluttering from its tip. He had not gone far when he heard the voices of men. His little heart beat wildly as he sped in the direction of the sound. So anxious was he to find Tarzan that he had no place in his mind for any doubt that the voices he heard might be those of others than his friends. Nor were they. Chattering and screaming, Nkima dropped plummet-like from high branches to alight upon the shoulder of his friend. One arm encircled Tarzan's neck, and from the little clenched paw the cleft stick brought the fluttering bit of paper directly in front of the ape-man's eyes. He saw writing upon it, handwriting that even in a brief glance he recognized. Yet he could not believe. It was incredible, preposterous to even imagine that little Nkima bore a message penned by Jane. The remarkable similarity between this handwriting and hers could be nothing more than a fantastic coincidence. Before Nkima could again escape him Tarzan slipped the message from the stick, and, while the monkey chattered and scolded, scanned it hurriedly. The Waziri, watching him, saw sudden concern mirrored in his expression. Where did you get this, Nkima, demanded the ape man. Who gave it to you? Nkima stopped scolding and scratched his head. Where did he get it? He could not recall. Many things had happened since then. His memory was a long, dim corridor, and this event a tiny thing at the far end. Something is wrong, Buana, asked Muviro. Nkima has brought you bad news. It is a message from Lady Greystoke. She and a party of friends were forced down in an aeroplane. They are lost somewhere without provisions or weapons. He turned his attention again to Nkima. Who gave you this, he demanded. Was it a she, a Tamangani? Slowly Nkima was recollecting. It was not a Tamangani, he said. A Gomangani. It was not a Gomangani. Who did give it to you, then? Now Nkima recalled. No one gave it to Nkima. Nkima found it in Awala. What does he say, Buana? asked Muviro, for Nkima had spoken in the language of his people, which only Tarzan, among men, understands. He says he found it in a nest, explained the lord of the jungle. That might mean a house, or a hut, or a shelter, the lair of a wild beast, or the nest of a bird. I will find out. Nkima, what built the nest in which you found this? Tamangani. The Gomangani do not build a walla like it. Where is it? Try to recall. You must take me to it. Where was it? Nkima waved a paw loosely in the general direction of the west. You will take Tarzan to this nest, said the ape man. Instantly Nkima was all excitement. He felt quite important. He hopped to the ground and pulled on Tarzan's leg. Come with Nkima, he begged. Lead your warriors toward the north until you find the village of the Kavaru, Tarzan directed Muviro. If they are unfriendly, and you cannot enter their village to recover Bwira, wait for me there. If you find her and take her away, leave some sign that will tell me so. You understand? Yes, Buana. Then Kima and I go to search for Lady Greystoke. It was not by a direct route that Nkima led Tarzan toward the shelter in which he had found the message, but a circuitous one that retraced his wanderings. Each of his mischances and adventures of the preceding days was a landmark on the back trail, and thus slowly he found his way back toward the shelter. At one point he told Tarzan he had seen a strange Tomangani with a she Tomangani, and Tarzan was almost convinced that it might have been Jane, the captive of a Kavuru. 
he was tempted to give up the search for the shelter where the message had been found and attempt to trail the man and the woman, but Nkima could not tell him in which direction they had gone, the spore had disappeared, and his judgment told him that the place to start his search for Jane was at some point at which he might be positive she had been. It required infinite patience to endure the vagaries of Nkima's memory and his inability to hold for long to a fixed continuity of thought, but most beasts are patient, and in this respect Tarzan was like his fellows of the jungle. His reward came eventually when Nkima proudly led him down through the trees to the camp that the maroon flyers had made, the camp where Nkima had found the note. Here Tarzan found indisputable evidence that Jane had indeed been a member of the ill-starred company and plain before him lay the trail that they had taken toward the east. No longer was he dependent upon Kima, and with renewed hope he swung off into the unknown country that had swallowed his mate. Retribution is seldom swift or well-directed, yet perhaps in his terror Prince Alexis Sporov was tasting the immediate fruits of his misdeeds through a punishment scarcely less drastic than death itself, for Sporov was an arrant coward and he was suffering as only a coward might as he trembled alone in the menacing silence of the mysterious jungle. And he was torn between two terrors, one of which almost cancelled the other. He was afraid of the denizens of the jungle and the thought of facing a jungle night alone, and it was this fear that almost submerged another, his fear of brown. But not quite. As much as he longed to return to the companionship of those he had persistently sought to offend or injure, the knowledge that Brown would kill him if he did, exiled him to the torture of his terror-stricken loneliness. When he had finally been forced to definitely abandon any thought of returning to the others, he determined to follow the plan that he had originally suggested to them, the plan that had been voted down in favour of Jane's suggestion that they search toward the east for friendly tribes, and so he set his face toward the west in the hope that he might stumble upon a white settlement in the Belgian Congo. One ordeal that he dreaded lay ahead of him on this route, for in retracing his steps he must pass the grave of his murdered wife. He had no regrets for his deed, but his superstitious mind was terror-ridden by imaginings induced by Tibbs' story of the murdered Duchess of Dunningham, who returned from the grave to carry away her maid. As Tibbs had, so did Sporo see a parallel in the mysterious disappearance of Annette, a disappearance that he could not account for logically in any other way. But there was no alternative. He must pass close to the grave and the scene of the murder. Once again he would wield the hand axe in the fullness of his imagination, and once again the warm blood of his victim would splatter upon his hand and his clothing. The first night he spent among the branches of a tree, too terrified to sleep. He heard the hunting beasts prowl beneath him. He heard the screams of stricken prey. The earth trembled to the roar of the king of beasts, and there were other sounds, stealthy, mysterious sounds that were even more terrifying because he could not identify them. But at last the night passed and dawn came to look down upon a haggard, unkempt creature that started at its own shadow, a creature exhausted by fright, by sleeplessness, and by hunger, a very different creature from the Prince Sporov of the Paris boulevards. His hands and arms, his unshaven face, his matted hair were caked with dirt and dried sweat, cut down his shrunken cheeks by muddy rivulets of tears. His mind was tottering. He talked to himself, and then cautioned himself to silence lest his voice might attract the attention of some beast of prey. Thus he stumbled on through the day without food and without water hopeless victim of his own avarice, a sorry contrast to the proud beasts he feared, a sad commentary upon the theory of evolution. It was mid-afternoon when the thing that he had dreaded occurred. He was walking abroad and, for a short distance, straight trail. As he had been constantly doing, he glanced behind him. His knees trembled. He thought that he must fall. For a moment he was paralyzed. For where the trail turned to disappear among the underbrush stood a great lion. He was eyeing Spore over praisingly. What he was doing abroad at that hour of the day when he should have been lying up waiting for evening and the hunting hours is a matter of his own concern, but there he was. He merely stood and contemplated Sporov. Presently the man regained control of his muscles. He started to move slowly along the trail. He had heard that if one ran, 
almost any beast of prey would pursue and overtake, for man is of the slowest of animals. As Sporov moved away, the lion moved after him. It came slowly, just keeping pace with the man. It was stalking him. When it was ready to do so, it would charge, and that would be the end. Sporov knew little of the habits of lions, but he had gleaned this much from yarns spun around the campfires, to which he had listened, even though he had never been encouraged to take part. He wondered how long it would be before the lion would rush at him and drag him down. He wanted to run. It was with difficulty that he restrained the impulse. He looked longingly at the trees that he was too weak to climb. A turn in the trail hid the lion from him, and then Sporov broke into a run. An instant later an angry growl sounded behind him. It seemed very close. The man threw a glance back across his shoulder. The lion was advancing at a trot. Its eyes were blazing, terrible yellow-green eyes that shriveled the last vestige of his self-control. Sporov voiced a piercing scream of terror. 23. Captive. Tarzan swung through the trees not far from a jungle trail that led toward the east. Nkima scampered sometimes ahead, sometimes above his master. He was very brave and truculent, for the sanctuary of a bronzed shoulder was always near. Usher, the wind, was blowing in Tarzan's face. To his nostrils it brought messages from the jungle ahead. It spoke of Hista, the snake, of Wapi, the antelope, and of Shieta, the leopard. Faintly from a great distance, it told of water it had passed upon its journey. Thus could Tarzan direct his course and select his camp sites far ahead when he passed through country that was unfamiliar to him. There came also upon the breath of Usher the pungent odor of Numa, the lion, and a moment later Tarzan heard the angry growl of the king of beasts. Almost simultaneously he caught the scent spore of man, of a lone Tarmangani. Tarzan could almost picture the scene that was being enacted somewhere along that trail ahead of him, and he increased his speed, for a white man in this particular district might well be a member of the party that Jane had accompanied, he might know where she was or what fate had befallen her. It would not do to let Numa destroy him at least not until Tarzan had questioned him. No considerations of humanity prompted Tarzan of the apes to hasten to the aid of this unknown man, nor would it have been selfish callousness to the suffering of another that would have left him more or less indifferent but for the thought of Jane. He was a jungle animal, a fellow to the lion, and he knew that the lion must eat, even as he must. If it did not feed upon this man, it would feed upon some other living creature whose life was as precious to it as the man's was to him, and in the philosophy of the jungle one life is no more valuable than another, unless it be that of one's self or a friend. Tarzan knew that the two were not far ahead of him. The odor of Numa told him that the lion was not empty and that therefore he was probably stalking the Tamangani with no immediate likelihood that he would attack unless provoked. Then the quiet of the jungle was shattered by a scream of terror, and Tarzan guessed that the lion's short temper had been aroused. Instantly the ape-man swung forward at terrific speed, and so swiftly he sped through the middle terrace of the forest that even little Nkima had difficulty in keeping pace. Sporov thought that the lion was charging, but it was not. It was merely keeping its prey in sight, but the angry growl of annoyance was a warning against attempted escape and a threat of what the quarry might expect if it forced the king to exert himself unnecessarily at this hour of the day when heat lay heavy and humid upon the jungle and royalty should be taking its siesta. But Sporov would have been deaf to all warnings now even had he understood them. He was crazed with terror. His one, his only impulse was to escape, and so he ran on, his legs staggering from exhaustion and fear his heart pounding in his throat, choking the screams that trembled their unborn. Now indeed did Numa wax wroth. This pitiful thing was trying to escape him, and it was making him trot when he wished only to loaf along the trail at his ease until he was again ready to kill and feed. He would put an end to it, and that, quickly. He voiced another warning roar as he prepared to charge a roar that half paralyzed the man. Thinking the end had come, Sporo fell to his knees, turning so that he faced the lion, and as he did so a strange thing happened, 
a thing so remarkable that it surprised the lion quite as much as it did Sporov. A white man dropped from above into the trail between them. Sporov had never seen a man such as this, a bronze giant, almost naked, a handsome giant with grim, stern features, a giant who faced a lion with as little apparent concern as one might reveal in shooing away an alley cat. He just stood there facing the lion and waiting, and the lion stopped in its tracks, eyeing the intruder but with evidently growing displeasure. As Sporov looked at the man he realized that he was really not of gigantic proportions, yet he conveyed the impression of great size. Perhaps it was the suggestion of power and majesty in his mien that gave him the appearance of towering over other creatures. He stood, perhaps, a couple of inches over six feet, rounded muscles flowed smoothly beneath clear, bronzed skin, his proportions were as perfect for his kind as were those of the great lion he faced. It occurred to Sporov that these two were very much alike, and he began to be as afraid of the man as of the other beast. They stood thus facing each other for but a moment, then the lion growled, lashing its tail, and took a step forward. The man growled, and Sporov shuddered. Now, indeed, was he terrified. Above them a little monkey danced up and down upon the limb of a tree, chattering and scolding. He loosed upon the lion a vocabulary of rich invective, but to Sporov it was only the silly chattering of a monkey. The bronze giant moved slowly forward to meet the lion, from the mighty cavity of his deep chest rolled savage growls. Numa halted. He glanced quickly from side to side. He shook his head and, holding it upon one side, snarled, then he wheeled about and stalked majestically away without a backward glance. The man had outbluffed the lion. Suddenly the newcomer wheeled upon Sporov. Who are you? he demanded. Had the lion spoken, Sporov would have been little less surprised than he was to hear excellent English fall from lips that had just been voicing the hideous growls of a beast. He was so surprised that he did not reply, then the man repeated the question. This time his tone was peremptory, brooking no delay. I am Prince Alexis Sporov. Where are the rest of your party, Lady Greystoke and the others? Sporov's eyes went wide. How did this man know about them? Who could he be? I don't know. They left me alone to die in the jungle. Who left you alone? Only Lady Greystoke, myself, my valet, and the pilot, Brown were left of the original party when they abandoned me. Why did they abandon you? Brown wanted me to die. He did not want me to reach civilization and accuse him of murder. Tarzan scrutinized the man closely. There was nothing about him to arouse the ape man's admiration or liking. Whom did he murder? he asked. He killed my wife because he thought that she could not keep up with the rest of us and would thus prevent Brown's escape from the jungle. He knew that I would not leave her, and he did not want to lose any of the men, he was afraid to travel alone. Then why did he abandon you? demanded Tarzan. Sporov realized the inconsistency of his two statements, but his explanation came quickly, glibly. He was in love with Lady Greystoke, they ran off together. Tarzan's face darkened, and his fingers moved as though closing upon something, a throat, perhaps. Which way did they go? he asked. Along this same trail toward the east, replied Sporov. When? Yesterday, I think, or perhaps the day before. It seems very long that I have been alone in the jungle I have lost track of time. Where are Tibbs and Annette? Again Sporov was astonished. Who are you? he asked. How do you know so much about us? Tarzan did not reply. He just stood looking at the man. What was he to do with him? He would delay his search for Jane, yet he could not leave him alone to die, as he most assuredly would, because he believed that he was a friend of Jane. In her note she had given no details of the mishaps that had befallen them. She had only enumerated the members of the party, explained that their ship had crashed and that Princess Sporov had died. He naturally assumed that Jane was a guest of the Sporovs and that therefore the man must be her friend.
What became of Tibbs and Annette? Annette disappeared, explained the prince. We do not know what became of her. She just vanished in thin air. Her footprints led to a point beneath a tree. They stopped there. How long ago was that? I think it was the day before Brown ran away with Lady Greystoke. And Tibbs. Tibbs went with them. Why did he take Tibbs and not you? He was not afraid of Tibbs. He knew that I would protect Lady Greystoke and also bring him to justice if we ever reached civilization. Tarzan's level gaze held steadily upon Sporov as he appraised the man. He mistrusted him, but no hint of what was passing in his mind was betrayed by any changing expression of his inscrutable face. He was repelled by Sporov's face, by his manner, by the suggestion of contradiction and inconsistency in several of his statements, yet he realized that in the latter must lie some germ of fact. At least the fellow had definitely assured him that he was on Jane's trail, and convinced him that the girl Nkima had seen with the Kavaru must have been Annette, as Jane must still have been with Brown and Sporov at the time that Nkima had seen the other woman. Come, he said to the man, we shall go and find Lady Greystoke and Brown. Brown will kill me, said Sporov. He has threatened to many times. He will not kill you while I am with you. You do not know him. I do not need to know him, replied the ape man, I know myself. I am too weak to travel fast, explained Sporov. If you know this country, you had better take me to some village and then go on after Brown yourself. I have not eaten for a long time. I doubt that I could walk another mile, I am so weak from hunger. Stay here, directed Tarzan. I will get food, then we will go on after Brown. Sporov watched the man move off into the forest, a little monkey perched upon one broad shoulder. 24. Down into darkness. Jane's thoughts had been far away as she swung along the trail behind Tibbs and Brown that afternoon, they had been far to the west where a little, time-worn cabin stood near the shore of a landlocked cove on the west coast. There had centered many of the important events and thrilling adventures of her life, there she had met that strange demigod of the forest whom she had later come to know as Tarzan of the Apes. Where was he now? Had he received her cablegram? If he had, he was already searching for her. The thought gave her renewed hope. She longed for the sanctuary of those mighty arms, for the peace and safety that his strength and jungle craft afforded. As her thoughts re-explored the winding back trail of time her pace slowed and she dropped still farther in the rear of her companions. For the moment they were forgotten, she was alone in the great jungle of her memories. But she was not alone. Eyes watched her every move, from the foliage of the trees above, they watched her, ever keeping pace with her. Presently she felt an unaccountable urge to turn back. She wondered why. Was it a woman's intuition directing her for her best good? Was it a beneficent or a malign influence? She could only wonder. At first this peculiar urge was only a faint suggestion, then it became more pronounced became a force beyond her power to deny. At last she ceased to wonder or to question. Tibbs and Brown seemed very far away. She thought of calling to them, but she knew that it would be useless. For just an instant longer she hesitated, striving to force her will to drive her along the trail in an effort to overtake them, then she surrendered. A power stronger than she controlled her, and she turned docilely back away from them. It was as though someone was calling to her in a voice that she could not hear but that she must obey. It offered her nothing, nor did it threaten her. She had neither hope nor fear because of it. When the noose of the Kavaru dropped about her she felt no surprise, no terror, her sensibilities were numbed. She looked into the savage, painted face of the white man who drew her to a limb beside him and removed the noose from about her. It all seemed perfectly natural as though it was something that had been foreordained since the beginning of time. The man lifted her to a shoulder and started off through the trees toward the east away from the trail that ran in a northeasterly direction at that point. 
He did not speak, nor did she. It all seemed quite in order. This state of mind persisted for a matter of an hour or so, then it gradually commenced to fade as she slowly emerged from the state of hypnosis that had deadened her sensibilities. Slowly the horror of her situation dawned upon her. She realized that she was in the clutches of a strange, savage creature that was also a white man. She knew now that she had been hypnotized, the victim of a strange power that turned her will to its own purposes yet left her conscious of all that transpired. She felt that she must do something about it, but what was there to do? From the ease with which the man carried her, she knew that his strength was abnormal, far beyond any that she could pit against it in an effort to escape. Her only hope lay in evolving some stratagem that would permit her to elude him when he was off guard. This she could never hope to do as long as he carried her. She wondered where he was taking her and to what fate. If she could only carry on a conversation with him she might discover, but what language would such a creature speak? Well, she could only try. Who are you? she asked in English. What are you going to do with me? The man grunted and then mumbled in a Bantu dialect with which she was familiar, I do not understand. Jane experienced a moment of elation that was great by contrast with the hopelessness of her situation when she realized that he spoke a language she was familiar with. I understand you, she said in the same dialect that he had used. Now tell me who you are and why you have taken me. I am not an enemy of your people, but if you keep me or harm me my people will come and destroy your village, they will kill many of you. Your people will not come. No one ever comes to the village of the Kavuru. If any did, they would be killed. You call yourselves Kavuru. Where is your village? You will see. What are you going to do with me? I take you to Kavandavanda. Who is Kavandavanda? she demanded. He is Kavandavanda. The man spoke as though that was sufficient explanation. It was as though one said, God is God. What does he want of me? What is he going to do with me? If he wants ransom, if he want ransom, my people will pay much to have me back unharmed. You talk too much, snapped the Kavuru. Shut up. For a while Jane was silent, then she tried again, spurred on by the discomfort of the position in which she was being carried. Put me down she said. I can travel through the trees quite as well as you. There is no reason why you should carry me. It will be easier for us both if you let me walk. At first the Kavuru appeared to ignore the suggestion, but at last he put her down. Do not try to escape, he warned. If you do try to, I may have to kill you. No one must ever escape from a Kavuru. Jane stretched her cramped muscles and surveyed her captor. He was indeed a savage-appearing specimen, but how much of that was due to his natural countenance and how much to the paint, the nose ornament and the earrings she could not guess. Like many savage or primitive people, his age was undeterminable by his appearance, yet somehow she felt that he was a young man. What is your name? she asked. Ogdly, he replied. You are a chief, of course, she said, hoping to make a favorable impression by flattery. I am not a chief, he replied. There is only one chief, and that is Kavandavanda. She tried to draw him on into a conversation, but he was short and taciturn at first, finally becoming ugly. Shut up, or I will cut your tongue out, he snapped. Kavandavanda does not need your tongue. Thereafter, Jane was silent, for there was that about her captor and the tone in which he made the threat that told her it was no idle one. That night he bound her securely with his rope while he lay down to sleep, and the next morning they were on their way again. At the halt he had gathered some fruit and nuts, and these formed the only breakfast that they had. In the middle of the forenoon they came suddenly to the end of the forest and looked out across a narrow plain to a lofty mountain at the foot of which Jane thought that she discerned what appeared to be a palisade built close to a perpendicular cliff. 
The plain was strewn with large boulders and cut by several washes, so that as they advanced across it toward the mountain the palisade was sometimes in view and sometimes hidden from their sight. As they approached more closely, Jane saw that the palisade was a massive affair of stone and that it formed three sides of a rectangle the rear wall of which was evidently the face of the mighty cliff that loomed high above them. A small river followed a winding course across the plain from the very foot of the palisade, as though it were born there, though when she came closer she saw that it flowed from beneath the stone wall through an opening left for that purpose. Her captor shouted as he approached the palisade, and a moment later one of the two massive gates swung open a little way to admit them. Beyond was a narrow street flanked by small stone houses, the flat roofs of which suggested that this was a country of little rain. They were houses similar in design to those built of stone and adobe by the prehistoric builders of the ancient pueblos of southwestern America. Savage warriors loitered before tiny doorways or tended cooking fires built in little outdoor ovens. Like Ogdley, they were all young men, their ornaments, apparel, and weapons being almost identical to his. Some of them gathered around Jane and her captor, examining her and asking questions of Ogdley. You and Adeni have all the luck, grumbled one. He captured a black girl and a white girl all during the full of the moon. The black girl got away from him, said another. Yes, but he went right back into the forest and caught a white girl. He will get no teeth for the black girl. No, but he will get a fine string for the white one, and Ogli will get another row of teeth, that will make four for Ogli. Kavanda Vanda will think well of him. He should, said Ogdli. I am the greatest warrior among the Kavuru. A big fellow grunted derisively. You have but three rows of teeth, he taunted. I have seven, and he tapped his chest where it joined his throat. Jane, listening to this strange conversation, made little of it until this gesture of the speaker called her attention to the necklaces of human teeth about his throat, then she saw that there were seven rows of them and that about Ogley's neck were three similar strands. She glanced at some of the other warriors. Some had one or two, others had none. These necklaces were evidently a sign of greatness, evidencing the prowess of the individual and his success in capturing women. Suddenly she became aware of a marked peculiarity of her surroundings, here she was in an isolated village of a warlike people far removed from other villages, a village in which there were many men in the prime of life, yet she had seen neither women nor children. What could it mean? Did some strange custom require that women and children remain indoors at certain hours or upon certain occasions, or were there no women nor children? If the latter were true, then what became of the women captives of which they boasted? But it could not be true, there must be women and children. But if there were women, why did the men attend the cooking fires? That was no fit work for warriors. These observations and thoughts passed quickly through Jane's mind as she was led along the narrow street by Ogdley. At an intersection her captor turned into a narrow alley and led her to a low, circular building that lent to her surroundings a still greater similitude to the ancient villages of the Pueblos, for this was a windowless structure against which leaned a primitive wooden ladder leading to the roof. If it were not a ceremonial kiva its appearance belied its purpose. With a grunt, Ogli motioned her to proceed him up the ladder, and when she gained the roof she found still further evidence of kiva-like attributes, for here the top of a second ladder protruded from a small, rectangular opening. Ogli pointed to it. Go down, he commanded, and stay down. Do not try to escape. It will be worse for you if you do try. Jane looked down through the aperture. She could see nothing, just a black pit. Hurry, admonished Ogli. The girl placed a foot upon a rung of the ladder and started slowly down into the black, mysterious void. She was no coward but her courage was tested to its utmost as she forced her unwilling feet down that shaky, primitive ladder. Uppermost in her mind was the fact that she had seen no women in the village of the Kavuru. What had been the fate of the captives of which the warriors had boasted? Had they, too, 
descended this ladder? Had they gone down into this dark abyss never to return? 25. Defeat Muviro and the Waziri came to the end of the forest. Before them stretched a narrow plain that lay at the foot of a lone mountain. One of the warriors pointed. There is a village built at the foot of that high cliff. I see the palisade. Muviro shaded his eyes with his hand. He nodded. It must be the village of Kavuru. We have found it at last. Perhaps we shall not find Bwira, but we will punish the Kavuru. We will teach them to leave the daughters of the Waziri alone. The other warriors assented with savage growls, for they were Waziri, known for ages as mighty warriors. Who might dare encroach upon their rights? Who might steal their women with impunity? None. Other tribes suffered similar losses. They made big noise with tom-toms and shouting. They danced their war dances. And then, when there was little chance of overtaking their enemy, they set out in pursuit, but always they abandoned the chase before they overhauled the quarry. Not so the Waziri. What they undertook, they pursued relentlessly whether it brought victory or defeat. Come, said Muviro, and led his warriors out upon the plain toward the village of the Kavuru. Suddenly he halted. What is that? he demanded. The Waziri listened. A low droning sound that at first barely commanded the attention of their ears was growing steadily in volume. The warriors, standing in silence, looked up toward the heavens. There it is, said one, pointing. It is a canoe that flies. I saw one pass low over the country of the Waziri. It made the same sound. The ship came rapidly into view, flying at an altitude of three or four thousand feet. It passed over the plain and the Waziri, then it banked steeply and turned back. With motor throttled, the ship descended gracefully in wide spirals. At a few hundred feet from the ground the pilot gave it the gun, but still he continued to circle low over the plain. He was searching for a landing place. For two hours he had been searching for one, almost hopelessly. Lost, and with only a little fuel remaining in his tanks, he welcomed the sight of this open plain and the village with heartfelt thanks. He knew that he couldn't get fuel here, but he could get his position, and at least he was saved from making a forced landing over the forest. Flying low, he saw the Waziri, white-plumed savages evidently coming from the forest, and he saw natives emerging from the village, too. He saw that these were different in a most surprising way, and he dropped lower and circled twice more to make sure. His companion, in the front cockpit, scribbled a note and handed it back to him, what do you make of them? They look white to me. They are white, wrote the pilot. Owing to the washes and boulders there were not many safe landing places available on the plain. One of the best, or perhaps it would be true to say least impossible, was directly in front of the village, another, and perhaps a better one, lay across the plain, near the forest. Muviro and his waziri stood near the edge of it, a band of primitive savages, and the sight of these and the implications their presence suggested determined the pilot to set his ship down nearer the village and its white inhabitants. Tragic error. Once again the ship circled the plain, rising to an altitude of a thousand feet, then the pilot cut his motor and glided toward a landing. Muviro resumed his advance upon the village, and as the way led him and his men down into a deep wash they did not see the actual landing of the ship, but when they again reached higher ground they saw two men climbing from the cockpits of the plain, while advancing from the open gates of the Kavura village was a swarm of savage, white warriors, whose hostile intent was all too apparent to Muviro. They were white. No longer was there any doubt in the mind of the Waziri chieftain, now he knew that these were indeed the Kavuru. They were shouting and brandishing their spears as they ran toward the two aviators. Apparently they had not as yet discovered the presence of the Waziri, or, if they had, they ignored them. Muviro spoke to his men in low tones, and they spread out in a thin line and moved silently forward at a trot. 
They did not yell and prance as do many native warriors, and because they did not they seemed always to inspire greater fear in the hearts of their enemies. There were only ten of them, yet they charged the savage Kavuru, who outnumbered them ten to one, with all the assurance that they might have been expected to have had the odds been reversed. The flyers, seeing that the natives were hostile, fell back toward their ship. One of them fired a shot over the heads of the advancing Kavuru, but as it had no deterrent effect, the man fired again, and this time a Kavuru fell. Still the savage white warriors came on. Now both the flyers opened fire, yet on came the Kavuru. Soon they would be within spear range of their victims. The men glanced behind them as though seeking temporary shelter but what they saw must have been disheartening a thin line of black warriors trotting silently toward them from the rear. They did not know that these would have been friends and allies, so one of them raised his pistol and fired at Muviro. The bullet missed its mark, and the Waziri chieftain sought cover behind a boulder, ordering his men to do likewise, for he knew better than the Kavuru the deadly effectiveness of firearms. Then he called to the two flyers in English, telling them that the Waziri were friendly, but the harm had already been done, the delay permitted the Kavuru to close in upon the two men before the Waziri could join forces with them to repel the enemy. Perhaps it would have done no good, so greatly did the Kavuru outnumber them all. With savage yells they bore down upon the flyers, though several of their number dropped before the fire that the two poured into their ranks. Now they were close, but close to were the Waziri, who were moving forward again, now at a run. Presently the Kavuru spears began to fly. One of the strangers fell with a weapon through his heart. Now a volley of spears leaped from the hands of the Waziri, momentarily checking the advance of the Kavuru, who seemed to fear spears more than they did firearms. They did not retreat, but merely paused a moment, then they launched another flight of spears, and this time the second flyer fell, and with him three Waziri. A moment later the Kavuru and Waziri closed in hand-to-hand -hand struggle. Now there were but seven of the latter, and though they fought valiantly, they were no match for the hundred Kavuru warriors that overwhelmed them. Fighting close to the bodies of the slain flyers, Muviro and one of his warriors, Belando, salvaged the pistols and ammunition of the dead men. At close quarters the firearms had a more definite effect on the morale of the Kavuru stopping them temporarily and permitting Muviro and his remaining warriors to fall back in search of shelter. Now there were but four of them, Muviro, Belando, and two others. The Waziri chief sought to reach a pile of granite rising spire-like from the plain, and at last he was successful, but now only Belando remained alive to carry on the unequal struggle with him. Together they fell back to the rocky sanctuary Muviro had chosen, and while Muviro held the Kavuru at bay Belando clambered to the summit safely out of effective spear range, then he fired down upon the enemy while Muviro climbed to his side. Again and again the Kavuru hurled their spears aloft, but the height was too great for any but the most powerful muscles, and even the weapons of these had lost so much speed and momentum by the time they reached the level at which their target stood that they ceased to constitute a menace. The revolvers and bows of the two Waziri, however, still did effective work, so effective that the Kavuru fell back toward their village, and with the coming of the swift equatorial twilight Muviro saw them definitely give up the attack and file back toward the village gate. As they passed the grounded ship, Muviro saw that they avoided it and guessed that they were afraid of it as of something supernatural, then night fell, blotting out the scene. Sorrowfully Muviro and Belando descended from the rock that had afforded them sanctuary. They sought shelter and a place to sleep in the forest, the unpenetrable gloom of which seemed no darker than their future. But they made no plans, they were too exhausted, too overcome by grief and disappointment to think clearly. If only the big buana would come, sighed Belando. Yes, agreed Muviro. If he had been here, this would not have happened. 26. Tarzan Stalks Brown Tea morning mist floated lazily in the still air, the soul of the dead knight clinging reluctantly to earth. A strange hush lay on the jungle, a silence as poignant as a leopard's scream. It awakened Brown. 
He moved gingerly in the crotch of the tree into which he had wedged himself the evening before. He was stiff and lame and sore. Every muscle ached. He looked up at Tibbs, a couple of feet above him, and grinned. The Englishman was spread-eagled across two parallel branches to which he was clinging tightly in restless slumber. He looks like he was going to be grilled, mused the pilot. Poor old Tibbsy. He spoke the last words half aloud. Tibbs opened his eyes and looked around. For a moment his expression was surprised and troubled, then he discovered Brown below him, and full consciousness returned. My word, he exclaimed with a shake of his head. I was just drawing is Grace's both. You even wait on him in your sleep, don't you, Tibbsy? Well, you see, sir, it's been my life, always, and I wouldn't ask for a better one, peace and orderliness. Everything clean and straight, everything always in its place. And not would work, sir. And you're always treated well, that is, by gentlemen. It's been my good fortune to be in the service mostly of gentlemen. Like this Sporov guy, inquired Brown. He was not a gentleman. But he was a prince, wasn't he? Don't that make him a gentleman? Tibbs scratched his head. It should but it doesn't, not always. I sometimes think when I see a bounder with a title that possibly at some time his mother may have been indiscreet. Brown laughed. I guess there must have been a lot of indiscretion in high places, he remarked, and then, how about pulling our freight, Tibbsy? We got a long ways to go on a pair of empty stomachs. Wearily the two men plodded on through the jungle. All the forces of nature and the laws of chance seemed to have combined against them from the first. Now they were sad, disheartened, almost without hope, yet each tried bravely to keep up the spirits of the other. It was oftentimes a strain, and occasionally one of them voiced the morbid doubts and fears that assailed them both. Do you believe in black magic, Tibsy? asked Brown. Hi have I seen some strange things in my life, sir, replied the Englishman. You know what the old dame come down here to look for, don't you? Yes, something that would renew youth, wasn't it? Yes. I know a lot about that. I knew a lot I didn't tell her. If I had she might not have come, and I sure wanted her to. I wanted to get that formula. Cripes, Tibsy. It would be worth a million back in civilization. But it's well guarded. A few men have tried to get it. None of them was ever heard of again. Well, we ain't trying to get it now. We got troubles enough trying to find our way out of this jungle to be bothering with any elixir of life. If we just go along and mind our own business, we'll be all right. I don't know about that. I never took much stock in black magic, but it is funny all the things that's happened to this expedition ever since it started out. Just like somebody or something had put a jinx on it. It started right off the bat with that zero-zero flying weather, then come the forced land in, then the old dame's murdered, then Annette disappears, now Lady Greystoke's gone. Do you realize, Tibsy, that of the six that took off from Croydon there's only two of us left? It's just like something was following us, picking off one at a time. It sure gets my goat when I stop to think about it. It's doggone funny, Tibsy, that's what it is. I see nothing amusing in it, sir, objected Tibbs, but then Hivey always erred that you Americans had a strange sense of humour. The trouble is that you Englishmen don't understand English, explained Brown. But let's skip it. The question is, which one of us will be next? Don't, beg Tibbs. That's just what Hivey been trying not to think about. Brown turned again and looked back at his companion who was following along a narrow trail. The American grinned. Wasn't Lady Greystoke walking behind when it got her, he reminded. Tarzan, following the trail toward the east, found spore over problem. The man was too exhausted to move faster than a snail's pace, and even so he was compelled to rest often. 
Tarzan was anxious to overtake Brown and Tibbs with whom he believed Jane to be. He would kill Brown. The very thought of the man caused the scar across his forehead to burn red, the scar that Bulgani, the gorilla, had given him years ago in that first life and death struggle that had taught the boy Tarzan one of the uses of his dead father's hunting knife and thus set his feet upon the trail that led to the lordship of the jungle. Ordinarily the life of a strange Tomangani would have weighed as nothing as against a delay in his search for Jane, but Alexis had given the impression that he had been Jane's friend and protector, and Tarzan could not desert him to the certain fate that would have claimed such as he alone in the jungle. So the Lord of the Jungle decided to remain with Sporov until he could turn him over to the chief of some friendly tribe for protection and guidance to the nearest outpost of civilization, or place him in the hands of his own Waziri. Seemingly imbued with many of the psychic characteristics of the wild beasts among which he had been reared, Tarzan often developed instinctive likes or dislikes for individuals on first contact, and seldom did he find it necessary to alter his decisions. He had formed such a conviction within a few moments after his meeting with Sporov, a conviction which made it doubly distasteful to him to be in the company of the man and waste time befriending him. He mistrusted and disliked him, but for Jane's sake he would not abandon him. Little Nkima seemed to share his mistrust, for he seldom came near the stranger, and when he did he bared his teeth in a menacing snarl. Chafing under the delay forced upon him by Sporov's physical condition, which bordered on complete exhaustion, the ape man at last swung the surprised Sporov to his shoulder and took to the trees with the agility and speed of a small monkey. Alexis voiced a cry of remonstrance that carried also a note of fear, but he was helpless to escape the situation into which he had been snatched as though by the hand of fate. Should he succeed in wriggling from that vice like grasp, it would only lead to injury in the resultant fall to the ground below. So Alexis shut his eyes tight and hoped for the best. He knew that they were moving rapidly through the trees, the swift passage of foliage and twigs across his body told him that. He remonstrated with the bronzed savage that was carrying him, but he might as well have sought conversation with the sphinx. At last he gained sufficient courage to open his eyes, then, indeed, did he gasp in horror for at that very moment Tarzan leaped out into space to catch a trailing liana and swing to another tree upon his arboreal trail. Fifty feet below the eyes of the thoroughly terrified Sporov lay the hard ground. He screamed aloud, and then he found articulate voice. Take me down, he cried. Let me walk. You'll kill us both. Overcome by terror, he struggled to free himself. It will be you who will kill us if you don't lie still, warned the ape man. Then take me down. You are too slow, replied Tarzan. I cannot be held to the pace of Kota, the tortoise, if I am ever to overtake the man you call Brown. If I take you down I shall have to leave you alone here in the jungle. Would you prefer that? Sporov was silent. He was trying to weigh the terrors of one plan against those of the other. All that he could think of was that he wished he were back in Paris, which really didn't help at all in this emergency. Suddenly Tarzan came to an abrupt halt on a broad limb. He was listening intently. Sporo saw him sniffing the air. It reminded him of a hound on a scent trail. What do those two men look like? demanded Tarzan. Describe them to me, so that I may know Brown when I see him. Tibbs is a small man with thin hair and a pinched face. He is an Englishman with a slight Cockney accent. Brown is a big fellow, an American. I suppose he would be called good-looking, added Sporov, grudgingly. Tarzan dropped to a trail that they had crossed many times as it wound through the jungle, and set Sporov on the ground. Follow this trail, he directed. I am going on ahead. You are going to leave me alone here in the jungle, demanded Alexis, fearfully. I will come back for you, replied the ape man. You will be safe enough for the short time I shall be gone. But suppose a lion commenced Sporov. There are no lions about, interrupted Tarzan. There is nothing near that will harm you. How do you know? 
I know. Do as I tell you and follow the trail. But, Sporo started to expostulate, then he gasped and sighed resignedly, for he was alone. Tarzan had swung into the trees and disappeared. The ape man moved swiftly along the scent spore that had attracted his attention. His sensitive nostrils told him it was the scent of two white men. He sought in vain to detect the spore of a woman, but there was none if the two men were Brown and Tibbs, then Jane was no longer with them. What had become of her? The man's jaw set grimly. That information he would get from Brown before he killed him. A human life meant no more to Tarzan of the apes than that of any other creature. He never took life wantonly, but he could kill a bad man with less compunction than he might feel in taking the life of a bad lion. Any living thing that harmed his mate or threatened her with harm he could even find a species of grim pleasure in killing, and Sporov had convinced him that Brown meant harm to Jane if he had not already harmed her. The man's statement that Jane and Brown had run away together had not carried the conviction that the implication might have provoked, so sure was the lord of the jungle of the loyalty of his mate. Her intentions and her voluntary acts he never doubted nor questioned. What were his thoughts as he swung along the trail of the two unsuspecting men? That inscrutable face gave no suggestion of what passed in the savage mind, but they must have been grim and terrible thoughts of revenge. Rapidly the scent of his quarry grew stronger as the distance that separated them grew shorter. Now he went more slowly, and, if possible, even more silently. He moved as soundlessly as his own shadow as he came at last in sight of two men trudging wearily along the trail beneath him. It was they, he could not mistake them, the small Englishman, the big American. He paid little attention to Tibbs, but his eyes never left the figure of the aviator. Stealthily he stalked, as the lion stalks his prey. He was quite close above them. Easily now at any moment he could launch himself down upon his victim. Tibbs mopped the streaming perspiration from his forehead and out of his eyes. Phew, he sighed. It all seems so bloody useless. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. We won't never find her anyway. Let's stop and rest. I'm jolly well done in. I know how you feel, but we got to keep on looking though. We might find her. The more I think about it, the less I think Sporov got away with Lady Greystoke. What's made you change your mind, demanded Tibbs. I thought you was sure he had. Well, in the first place, she was armed, and she had the guts to defend herself. He ain't got no guts at all. He had enough to murder his poor wife, objected Tibbs. He sneaked up on her in the dark while she was asleep, sneered Brown. That didn't take no guts. But how about Annette? Brown shook his head. I don't know. I can't make it out. Of course, there was a good reason for his wanting to kill Annette. She had the evidence against him, she knew too much, and she wasn't armed. But what gets me is the way her footprints disappeared, just like she'd dissolved in thin air. If his footprints had been there too, and gone on, I'd have thought he picked her up and carried her into the jungle to finish her, but hers were all alone. They had stopped now while Tibbs rested. The ape man crouched above them, listening. He missed no word, but what effect they had upon him was not revealed by any change of expression. But he couldn't have picked her up and carried her horf and her not scream, argued Tibbs. That would have woke some of us. She might have been too scared to scream, explained Brown. Annette was awful scared of him. Lady Greystoke wasn't scared of him. Why didn't she call for help? Lady Greystoke wasn't scared of nothing. There was some dame, Tibbs. I quite agree with you replied the Englishman. Lady Greystoke was a most extraordinary person. High ops is how we find her. Yes, and I hope we find Annette. I can't believe she is dead, somehow. The note of yearning in the aviator's voice was not lost on the silent listener above. You was rather soft on Annette, wasn't you, 
said Tibbs, sympathetically. Plenty, admitted Brown, and that louse, Sporove, told how I was trying to make Lady Greystoke. Hell! Can you picture an English noblewoman falling for me? If you'll pardon my saying so, I can't, admitted Tibbs, candidly. No more can I. She was a swell dame, but Annette was the only girl I ever seen that had me gaga. I'd give well, all I ain't got to know for sure what became of her. Softly the ape man dropped to the trail behind the two men. I think I know, he said. At the sound of his voice they wheeled suddenly and faced him, surprise written large upon the face of each. Who the devil are you and where did you come from, demanded Brown, while Tibbs stood with his lower lip dropped, staring wide-eyed at the strange figure of the ape man. And what do you think you know, concluded the American. I think I know how your two women disappeared. Say, exclaimed Brown, what are you, anyway? This country's got me nuts, people disappearing and you jumping out of thin air like a spook. Are you a friend or what? Friend, replied Tarzan. What you running around undressed for, demanded Brown. Ain't you got no clothes, or ain't you got no sense? I am Tarzan of the Apes. Yeah? Well, I'm glad to meet you, Tarzan, I'm Napoleon. But spill what you know about Annette about both the dames. What got em? Was it Sporove? But of course you don't know nothing about Sporove. I know about Sporove, replied Tarzan. I know about the accident that wrecked your plane. I know the Princess Sporove was murdered. I think I know what happened to Lady Greystoke and Annette. Brown looked puzzled. I don't know how you got hep to all this, but you know plenty. Now tell me what happened to the two dames. The Kavuru got them. You are in Kavuru country. What are Kavuru? demanded Brown. A tribe of savage white men. They make a practice of stealing women, presumably for use in some religious rite. Where do they hang out? I don't know. I was looking for their village when I heard about the accident to your ship. I believe I can find it soon. It lies in a very wild country. The Kavuru have secrets they wish to guard, so no one is allowed to approach their village. What secrets? inquired Brown. They are believed to have discovered some sort of an elixir of life, something that will make old people young again. Brown whistled. So that's it? They were the people we were looking for. You were looking for the Kavuru, asked Tarzan, incredulously. The old dame was looking for the formula for that elixir stuff, explained Brown, and so am I, now that she is dead, someone has to carry on, you know, he added rather lamely. But say, how did you hear of the accident to the ship? How could you hear about it? We ain't seen or talked to no one. Suddenly Brown ceased speaking. His face darkened in anger. Sporove, he exclaimed. The prince, rounding a bend in the trail, halted when he saw Brown. The American started toward him, menacingly, an oath on his lips. Sporove turned to run. Stop him, he screamed to Tarzan. You promised you wouldn't let him harm me. The ape man sprang after Brown and seized him by the arm. Stop, he commanded. I promised the man. Brown attempted to wrench himself free. Let me go, you fool, he growled. Mind your own business. Then he aimed a heavy blow at Tarzan's jaw with his free hand. The ape man ducked and the clenched fist only grazed his cheek. The shadow of a grim smile touched his lips as he lifted the American above his head and shook him, then he tossed him into the thick underbrush that bordered the trail. You forgot Waterloo, Napoleon, he said. Upon the branch of a tree above, little Nkima danced and chattered, and as Brown was extricating himself with difficulty from the thorny embrace of the bushes, Nkima gathered a ripe and odorous fruit and hurled it at him. 
Tibbs looked on in consternation, believing that Brown had made a dangerous enemy in this giant white savage, and when he saw Tarzan step toward the struggling American he anticipated nothing less than death for both of them. But there was no anger in the breast of the ape man as he again seized the aviator and lifted him out of the entangling bushes and set him upon his feet in the trail. Do not again forget, he said, quietly, that I am Tarzan of the apes or that when I give an order it is to be obeyed. Brown looked the ape man squarely in the eyes for a moment before he spoke. I know when I'm licked, he said. But I still don't savvy why you wouldn't let me kill that Laos, he sure has it coming to him. Your quarrels are of no importance, said the ape man, but it is important to locate Lady Greystoke. And Annette, added Brown. Yes, agreed Tarzan. Also that you three men get back to civilization where you belong. You do not belong in the jungle. The world is full of fools who go places where they do not belong, causing other people worry and trouble. If Jaime make so bold as to say so, sir, I quite agree with you, ventured Tibbs. I shall be jolly well pleased to get out of this bally old jungle. Then don't any of you start killing off the others, advised Tarzan. The more of you there are the better chance you will have of getting out, and three are none too many. Many times you will find it necessary for someone to stand watch at night, so the more there are the easier it will be for all. Not for mine with that prince guy along, said Brown, emphatically. The last time he stood guard he tried to kill me with a hatchet, and he'd have done it if it hadn't been for old Tibsy. If you say I don't kill him, I don't kill unless he forces me to it, but I don't travel with him, and that's that. We'll get him back here, said Tarzan, and have a talk with him. I think I can promise you he'll be good. He was in a blue funk when I found him, a lion had been stalking him, and I think he'd promise anything not to be left alone again. Well, agreed Brown, grudgingly, get him back and see what he says. Tarzan called Sporo's name aloud several times, but there was no answer. He couldn't have gotten so very far, said Tibbs. He must hear you, sir. Tarzan shrugged. He'll come back when he gets more afraid of the jungle than he is of Brown. Are we going to sit here waiting for him, asked the American. No, replied Tarzan. I am going on to find the Kavuru village. My own people are somewhere to the east. I'll take you to them. Sporov will most certainly follow and catch up with us after we stop for the night. Come. 27. Madmen and Leopards A.S. Jane reached the foot of the ladder leading down into the dark interior of the Kiva-like structure in the village of the Kavuru. Her ears caught a faint sound as of someone or something moving at no great distance from her. Instantly she froze to silent immobility, listening. She thought that she heard the sound of breathing. Dim light from the opening above relieved the darkness immediately about her, and she knew that she must be revealed to whatever was in the room with her. Then a voice spoke, spoke in English with a familiar accent. Oh, madam. It is you? They got you, too. Annette. You are here. Then it was not the prince who took you away. No, madam. It was a terrible white man who held me powerless by some black magic. I could not cry out for help. I could not resist. I simply went to him, and he took me up into the trees and carried me away. One of them took me in the same way, Annette. They possess a hypnotic power beyond anything that I had ever dreamed might be possible. Have they harmed you, Annette? I have only been terribly frightened, replied the girl, because I don't know what they intend to do with me. Jane's eyes had become accustomed to the gloom of the dark chamber. Now she could discern more of the details of the interior. She saw a circular room with a litter of dry grasses and leaves on the hard dirt floor. Against one wall Annette was sitting on a little pallet of these same leaves and grasses that she had evidently scraped together. There was no one else, nothing else, in the room. What do you suppose they are going to do with us? asked Jane. Haven't they given you any clue at all? 
None, madam, absolutely none. Nor you? They have told you nothing. The man who captured me was named Ogdley. He told me that much and that he was taking me to someone called Kavanda Vanda, who, I gathered, is their chief. When I asked more questions he threatened to cut my tongue out, saying that Kavanda Vanda did not need my tongue. They are most unpleasant people. Ah, madam, that does not describe them, they are terrifying. If only Monsieur Brown was here. You have seen him lately, madam. He is well. Quite well, Annette, in body, but his heart was sick. He was worrying about you. I think he loves me very much, madam. I am sure of it, Annette. And I love him. It is terrible to have this happen now when we might have been so happy. Now we never shall be. I shall never see him again. I have that feeling, madam. It is what you call a, a premonition. I shall die here in this awful village, soon. Nonsense, Annette. You mustn't say such things, you mustn't even think them. What we should be thinking about is escape and nothing else. Escape? What chance have we, madam? I saw no guard at the entrance to this hole when they brought me in, explained Jane, and if there is none posted at night we can certainly get to the roof. From there on will depend upon what obstacles we find in our way, but it will be worth trying. Whatever you say, madam. Tonight then, Annette. Esha, madam. Someone is coming. Footsteps sounded plainly on the roof above them now, and then the opening through which they had entered was darkened by the form of a man. Come up, he commanded, both of you. Jane sighed. Our poor little plan, she bemoaned. What difference does it make, asked Annette. It would not have succeeded anyway. We shall have to try something else later, insisted the other, as she started to ascend the ladder. It will fail, too, prophesied Annette gloomily. We shall die here, both of us, tonight, perhaps. As they stepped out onto the roof Jane recognized the warrior as the one who had captured her. Now what, Ogdley, she asked. Are you going to set us free? Be still, growled the Kavuru. You talk too much. Kavanda Vanda has sent for you. Do not talk too much to Kavanda Vanda. He took hold of her arm to urge her along a soft, smooth, sun-tanned arm. Suddenly he stopped and wheeled her about until she faced him. A new fire burned in his eyes. I never saw you before, he said, in a low voice. I never saw you before. It was an almost inaudible whisper. Jane bared her teeth in a flashing smile. Look at my teeth, she said. You will soon be wearing them, then you will have furrows. I do not want your teeth, woman growled Ogley huskily. You have cast a spell on me, I, who have forsworn women, am bewitched by a woman. Jane thought quickly. The change in the man had come so suddenly, and his infatuation was so apparent that for an instant it only frightened her, then she saw in it possibilities that might be turned to the advantage of herself and Annette. Ogley, she whispered softly, you can help me, and no one need ever know. Hide us until tonight. Tell Kavanda Vanda that you could not find us, that we must have escaped, then come back after dark and let us out of the village. Tomorrow you can come out to look for us, and perhaps, Ogdley, you will find me find me waiting for you in the forest. Her words, her tones, were provocative. The man shook his head as though to rid his brain of an unwelcome thought, he passed a palm across his eyes as one who would push aside a veil. No, he almost shouted, then he seized her roughly and dragged her along. I will take you to Kavanda Vanda. After that you will bewitch me no more. Why are you afraid of me, Ogdley, she asked. I am only a woman. That is why I am afraid of you. You see no women here. There are none other than those who are brought for Kavanda Vanda, and they are here but briefly. 
I am a priest. We are all priests. Women would contaminate us. We are not allowed to have them. If we were to weaken and succumb to their wiles, we should live in torment forever after death, and if Kavandavanda found it out, we should die quickly and horribly. What is he saying, madam, asked Annette. What are you talking about? It is preposterous, Annette, replied Jane, but Ogley has developed a sudden infatuation for me. I tried to play upon it in order to tempt him to let us escape and meet me in the forest tomorrow. It offered hope. Oh, madam. You would not. Of course not, but all is fair in love and war, and this is both. If we ever get into the forest, Annette, it will just be too bad for Ogley if he can't find us. And what does he say to it? Thumbs down. He is dragging me off to Kavandavanda as fast as he can, so that temptation may be removed from his path. All our hopes are dashed, madam, said Annette, woefully. Not entirely, if I know men, replied Jane. Ogley will not so easily escape his infatuation. When he thinks he has lost me, it will tear at his vitals, then anything may happen. The Kavuru was leading the two girls along the main street toward the rear of the village. Confronting them was a heavy gate across the bottom of a narrow cleft in the cliff that towered ominously above the village. Ogley opened the gate and herded them through into the narrow, rocky cleft, beyond which they could see what appeared to be an open valley, but when they reached the far end of the cleft they found themselves in a box canyon entirely surrounded by lofty cliffs. A small stream of clear water wound down through the canyon and out through the cleft and the village where it was entirely bridged over at the outer gate as well as in the cleft leading into the canyon. The floor of the canyon appeared extremely fertile, supporting numerous large trees and growing crops. In the small fields Jane saw men laboring beneath the watchful eyes of Kavuru warriors. At first she paid little heed to the workers in the fields, as Ogley led her and Annette toward a massive pile of buildings standing in the center of the canyon, but presently her attention was attracted to one of the laborers who was irrigating a small patch of kaffir corn. Suddenly he threw down the crude wooden hoe he was using and stood upon his head in the mud. I am a tree, he screamed in the Bukina dialect, and they have planted me upside down. Turn me over, put my roots in the ground, irrigate me, and I will grow to the moon. The Kavuru warrior who was guarding the workers in the vicinity stepped up to the man and struck him a sharp blow across the shins with the haft of his spear. Get down and go to work, he growled. The worker cried out in pain, but he immediately came to his feet, picked up his hoe, and continued to work as though there had been no interruption. A little farther on another worker, looking up and catching sight of the two white girls, rushed toward them. Before the guard could interfere he was close to Jane. I am the king of the world, he whispered, but don't tell them. They would kill me if they knew, but they can't know because I tell everyone not to tell them. Ogley leaped at the fellow and struck him over the head with his spear just as the guard arrived to drag him back to his work. They are all bewitched, explained Ogley. Demons have entered their heads and taken possession of their brains, but it is well to have them around as they frighten away other evil spirits. We keep them and take care of them. If they die a natural death, the demons die with them, if we were to kill them the demons would escape from their heads and might enter ours. As it is, they can't get out in any other way. And these workers are all madmen, asked Jane. Each has a demon in his head, but that doesn't keep them from working for us. Kavandavanda is very wise he knows how to use everything and everybody. Now they had arrived before closed gates in the wall surrounding the building that they had seen when they first entered the canyon. Two Kavuru warriors stood on guard at the entrance to Kavandavanda's stronghold, but at the approach of Ogli and his prisoners they opened the gates and admitted them. Between the outer wall and the buildings was an open space corresponding to the ballium of a medieval castle. In it grew a few large trees, a few clumps of bamboo, and patches of brush and weeds. It was ill-kept and unsightly. 
The buildings themselves were partially of unbaked brick and partially of bamboo and thatch, a combination which produced a pleasing texture, enhancing the general effect of the low, rambling buildings that seemed to have been put together at different times and according to no predetermined plan, the whole achieving an unstudied disharmony that was most effective. As they crossed to the entrance to what appeared to be the main building, a leopard rose from a patch of weeds, bared its fangs at them, and slunk away toward a clump of bamboo. Then another and another of the treacherous beasts, disturbed by their passage, moved sinuously out of their path. Annette, her eyes wide with fright, pressed close to Jane. I am so afraid, she said. They are ugly looking brutes, agreed Jane. I wouldn't imagine this to be a very safe place. Perhaps that is why there are no people here. Only the guards at the entrance ahead of us, said Annette. Ask Ogdly if the leopards are dangerous. Very, replied the Kavuru in reply to the question that Jane put to him. Then why are they allowed to run at large, demanded Jane. They do not bother us much in the daytime, partially because they are fairly well fed, partially because only armed men cross this courtyard, and partially because they are, after all, cowardly beasts that prefer to sneak upon their prey in the dark. But it is after dark that they best serve the purpose of Kavandavanda. You may be sure that no one escapes from the temple by night. And that is all that they are kept for? asked the girl. That is not all, replied Ogdly. Jane waited for him to continue, but he remained silent. What else, then? she asked. He gazed at her for a moment before he replied. There was a light in his eyes that appeared strange to Jane, for it seemed to reflect something that was almost compassion. He shook his head. I cannot tell, he said, but you will know soon enough another reason that the leopards are here in the outer court. They were almost at the entrance when a weird, wailing scream broke the stillness that seemed to brood like an evil thing above the temple of Kavandavanda. The sound seemed to come either from the interior of the mass of buildings or from beyond them, sinister, horrible. Instantly it was answered by the snarls and growls of leopards that appeared suddenly from amongst the weeds, the brush, or the bamboo and bounded off to disappear around the ends of the buildings. Something called to them, whispered Annette, shuddering. Yes, said Jane, something unclean, that was the impression conveyed to me. At the entrance there were two more guards to whom Ogley spoke briefly, then they were admitted. As they passed the portal and came into the interior they heard muffled screams and growls and snarls as of many leopards fighting, and to the accompaniment of this savage chorus the two girls were conducted through the dim rooms and corridors of the temple of Kavandavanda. Kavandavanda. Who, or what, was he? To what mysterious fate was he summoning them? Such were the questions constantly recurring in the thoughts of the girls. Jane felt that they would soon find answers, and she anticipated only the worst. There seemed to be no hope of escape from whatever fate lay in store for them. That one hope that had given her strength to carry on through danger-fraught situations many times in the past was denied her now, for she felt that Tarzan must be wholly ignorant of her whereabouts. How could he know where? In the vast expanse of the African wilderness, the ship had crashed. He would be searching for her, she knew that, for he must have long since received her cablegram, but he could never find her, at least, not in time. She must depend wholly upon her own resources, and these were pitifully meagre. At present there was only the frail straw of Ogley's seeming infatuation. This she must nurse. But how? Perhaps when he had delivered her to Kavandavanda he would return to the village and she would never see him again, then even the single straw to which her hope clung in the deluge of dangers that threatened to engulf her would be snatched from her. Ogdly, she said, suddenly, do you live here in the temple or back in the village? I live where Kavandavanda commands, he replied. Sometimes in the village, again in the temple. And now? Where do you live now? In the village. Jane mused. Ogdly would be of no good to her unless he were in the temple. 
You have lived here all your life, Octley. No. How long? I do not remember. Perhaps a hundred rains have come and gone, perhaps two hundred, I have lost count. It makes no difference, for I shall be here forever unless I am killed. I shall never die otherwise. Jane looked at him in astonishment. Was he another maniac? Were they all maniacs in this terrible city? But she determined to humor him. Then if you have been here so long, she said, you must be on very friendly terms with Kavandavanda. If you asked him a favor he'd grant it. Perhaps, he agreed, but one must be careful what one asks of Kavandavanda. Ask him if you can remain in the temple, suggested the girl. Why, demanded Ogdley, suspiciously. Because you are my only friend here, and I am afraid without you. The man's brows knit into an angry scowl. You are trying to bewitch me again, he growled. You have bewitched yourself, Ogdley, she sighed, and you have bewitched me. Do not be angry with me. Neither of us could help it. Her beautiful eyes looked up at him appealingly, seemingly on the verge of tears. Do not look at me like that, he cried, huskily, and then once more she saw the same look in his eyes that she had noticed before they left the village. She laid a hand upon his bare arm. You will ask him, she whispered. It was more a statement than a question. He turned away roughly and continued on in silence but on Jane's lips was a smile of satisfaction. Intuition told her that she had won. But what would she do with her success? Its implications terrified her. Then she gave a mental shrug. By her wits she must turn the circumstance to her advantage without paying the price, she was every inch a woman. As they passed through the temple corridors and apartments, Jane saw a number of black men, fat, soft, oily-looking fellows that reminded her of the guardians of a sultan's harem. They seemed to personify cruelty, greed, and craft. She instinctively shrank from them if they passed close. These, she assumed, were the servants of Kavandavanda. What then was Kavandavanda like? She was soon to know. 28. Kavandavanda a n idiot gibbered beneath the gloomy shadows of the forbidding forest. A little monkey swung low from a branch, and the idiot leaped for it, shrieking horribly. From high among the foliage of a nearby tree two appraising eyes watched the idiot. What passed in the brain behind those eyes only the creature and its maker knew. The idiot suddenly started to run blindly along a trail. He stumbled and fell. It was evident that he was very weak. He scrambled to his feet and staggered on. Through the branches above, the creature followed, watching, always watching. The trail debouched upon a little clearing, perhaps an acre in extent. A single tree grew alone near the far side. Beneath the tree sprawled three maned lions, young lions, they were, but in the prime of their strength. As the idiot stumbled into the clearing one of the lions arose and stared at the intruder, more in curiosity than in disapproval. The idiot saw the lions, and with loud screams, hideous screams, he bore down upon them waving his arms wildly above his head. Now lions are nervous, temperamental creatures. It is difficult to prophesy just what they will do under any given circumstances. The others had come to their feet with the first scream of the idiot, and now all three stood watching his approach. For just a moment they stood their ground before such an emergency as had never confronted any of them before, nor, doubtless, ever would again. Then the one who had first risen turned and bounded off into the jungle, his two companions close upon his heels. The idiot sat down suddenly and commenced to cry. They all run away from me, he muttered. They know I am a murderer, and they are afraid of me, afraid of me. Afraid of me. Afraid of me. His shrieking voice rose to a final piercing crescendo. The stalker among the trees dropped to the floor of the clearing and approached the idiot. He came upon him from behind. He was a Denny, the Carveru. 
stealthily he crept forward. In his hand was a coiled rope. Ideni leaped upon the idiot and bore him to the ground. The idiot screamed and struggled, but to no avail. The mighty muscles of the Kavuru held him and deftly bound his wrists together behind his back. Then Ideni lifted the man and set him upon his feet. The idiot looked at his captor with wide eyes from which terror quickly faded to be replaced by a vacuous grin. I have a friend, he mumbled. At last I have a friend, and I shall not be alone. What is your name, friend? I am Prince Sporov. Do you understand? I am a prince. Ideni did not understand, and if he had he would not have cared. He had been scouting for more girls and he had found an idiot. He knew that Kavanda Vanda would be pleased, for, while there were never too many girls, there were even fewer idiots, and Kavanda Vanda liked idiots. Ideni examined his captive. He discovered that he was weak and emaciated and that he was unarmed. Satisfied that the man was harmless, the Kavuru released his wrists, then he fastened the rope securely about Sporov's neck and led him off into the jungle along a secret, hidden path that was a short cut to the village. His mind broken by terror and privation, the European babbled incessantly as he staggered along behind his captor. Often he stumbled and fell, and always Ideni had to lift him to his feet, for he was too weak to rise without assistance. At last the Kavuru found food and halted while Sporov ate, and when they started on again Ideni assisted him, carrying him much of the way until at last they came to the village of the Kavuru beside the lone mountain in the wilderness. And in the meantime, Tarzan led Brown and Tibbs along the main trail, a much longer route to the same village, for none of them knew where it was located, and at best could only harbour the hope that this trail led to it. Sometimes Nkima rode upon Tarzan's shoulder, or, again, swung through the trees above the three men. He, at least, was carefree and happy, Tarzan was concerned over the fate of his mate, Brown was worried about Annette, and Tibbs was always sad on general principles when he was away from London. Being hungry and footsore and weary and terrified by the jungle and its savage life in no way lessened the pall of gloom that enveloped him. They were not a happy company but none could tell from Tarzan's manner or expression or any word that fell from his lips the bitterness of the sorrow that he held within his breast. He did not know what fate was reserved for the girl captives of the Kavuru, but his knowledge of the more savage tribes of these remote fastnesses offered but faint hope that he might be in time to rescue her. To avenge her was the best that he could anticipate. And while his thoughts dwelt upon her, recalling each least detail of their companionship, Jane was being led into a large, central room in the temple of Kavandavanda, king, witch doctor, and god of the Kavuru. It was a large, low room, its ceiling supported by columns consisting of the trunks of trees, the surfaces of which, stripped of bark and darkened by antiquity, bore a high polish. Toothless skulls hung in clusters from the capitals of the columns, white against the darkened surfaces of the ceiling and the columns, grinning, leering upon the scene below watching the silly antics of mortal men through the wisdom of eternity out of sightless eyes. The gloom of the remoter purlieus of the large chamber was only partially relieved by the sunlight shining through a single opening in the ceiling and flooding a figure seated upon a great throne on a dais carpeted with the skins of leopards. As her eyes rested for the first time upon the enthroned man, Jane was plainly aware of a mental gasp of astonishment. The picture was striking, barbaric, the man was beautiful. If this were Kavandavanda, how utterly different was he from any of the various pictures of him her imagination had conceived, and it was Kavandavanda, she knew, it would be none other. Every indolent, contemptuous line of his pose bespoke the autocrat. Here indeed was a king, nay, something more, even, than a king. Jane could not rid herself of the thought that she was looking upon a god. He sat alone upon the dais except for two leopards, one chained on either side of his great throne chair. Below him, surrounding the dais, were Kavuru warriors, and close at hand the soft, fat slaves such as Jane had seen elsewhere in the temple. Upon the floor, on each side of the dais, a dozen girls reclined upon leopard skins. They were mostly black girls, 
but there were a number with the lighter skins and the features of the Bedouins. One of the Bedouin girls and a couple of the blacks were reasonably comely of face and figure, but on the whole they did not appear to have been selected with an eye to pulchritude. Ogli led his two charges to within a few yards of the dais, then, as he knelt himself, gruffly ordered them to kneel. Annette did as she was bid, but Jane remained erect, her eyes fearlessly appraising the man upon the throne. He was a young man, almost naked but for an elaborate loincloth and ornaments. Many rows of human teeth suspended about his neck, covered his chest and fell as low as his loincloth. Armlets, bracelets, and anklets of metal, of wood, and of ivory, completed his barbaric costume. But it was not these things that riveted the girl's attention, but rather the divine face and form of the youth. At first Jane felt that she had never looked upon a more beautiful countenance. An oval face was surmounted by a wealth of golden hair, below a high, full forehead shone luminous dark eyes that glowed with the fires of keen intelligence. A perfect nose and a short upper lip completed the picture of divine beauty that was marred and warped and ruined by a weak, cruel mouth. Until she noticed that mouth, hope had leaped high in Jane's breast that here she and Annette might find a benevolent protector rather than the cruel savage they had expected Kavanda Vanda to be. The man's eyes were fixed upon her in a steady stare. He, too, was appraising, but what his reaction, his expression did not reveal. Neil, he commanded suddenly, in imperious tones. Why should I kneel, demanded Jane. Why should I kneel to you? I am Kavanda Vanda. That is no reason why an Englishwoman should kneel to you. Two of the fat, black slaves started toward her, looking questioningly at Kavanda Vanda. You refuse to kneel, asked the youth. Most certainly. The slaves were still advancing toward her, but they kept one eye on Kavanda Vanda. He waved them back. A strange expression twisted his lips. Whether it was from amusement or anger, Jane could not guess. It pleases me to discuss the matter, said the youth, then he commanded Ogdley and Annette to rise. You brought in both of these prizes, Ogdley, he asked. No, replied Ogdley. Ideni brought this one. He gestured toward Annette. I brought the other. You did well. We have never had one like her, she contains the seeds of beauty as well as youth. Then he turned his eyes upon Jane once more. Who are you? he demanded, and what were you doing in the country of the Carveru? I am Jane Clayton, Lady Greystoke. I was flying from London to Nairobi when our ship was forced down. My companions and I were trying to make our way to the coast when this girl and myself were captured by your warriors. I ask that you release us and give us guides to the nearest friendly village. A crooked smile twisted the lips of Kavanda Vanda. So you came in one of those devil birds, he said. Two others came yesterday. Their dead bodies lie beside their devil bird outside the city gates. My people are afraid of the devil bird, they will not go near it. Tell me, will it harm them? The girl thought quickly before she replied. Perhaps she might turn their superstitious fear to her advantage. They had better keep away from it, she advised. More devil birds will come, and if they find that you have harmed me or my companion they will destroy your village and your people. Send us away in safety, and I will tell them not to bother you. They will not know that you are here, replied the youth. No one knows what happens in the village of the Kavuru or the temple of Kavandavanda. You will not set us free? No. No stranger who enters the gates of the village ever passes out again, and you, least of all. I have had many girls brought to me, but none like you. You have plenty of girls here. What do you want of me? His eyes half closed as he regarded her. I do not know he said in a voice scarce raised above a whisper. I thought that I knew, but now I am not sure. Suddenly he turned his eyes upon Ogdley. Take them to the room of the three snakes, he commanded, and guard them there. They cannot escape, 
but see that they do not try. I don't want anything to happen to this one. Medek will show you the way, he nodded toward one of the fat blacks standing near the dais. What was all the talk about, madam, asked Annette, as they were being led through the temple by Medek. Jane told her, briefly. The room of the three snakes, repeated Annette. Do you suppose there are snakes in the room? She shuddered. I am afraid of snakes. Look above the doors of the rooms we pass, suggested Jane. I think you will find the answer to your question there. There is a doorway with a boar's head above it. We just passed one with two human skulls over the lintel, and there, on the other side of the corridor, ahead, is one with three leopards' heads. It is evidently their way of designating rooms, just as we number them in our hotels. I imagine it has no other significance. Medic led them up a flight of rude stairs and along a corridor on the second floor of the temple and ushered them into a room above the doorway of which were mounted the heads of three snakes. Ogdley entered the room with them. It was a low-sealed room with windows overlooking the courtyard that surrounded the temple. Annette looked quickly around the apartment. I don't see any snakes, madam, she said, with evident relief. Nor much of anything else, Annette. The Carveru don't waste much thought on furniture. There are two benches, madam, but no table and not a bed. There's the bed over in the corner, said Jane. That's just a pile of filthy skins, objected the French girl. Nevertheless, it's all the bed we'll get, Annette. What are you talking about? demanded Ogley. Don't think that you can escape. You haven't a chance, so there's no sense in planning anything of the sort. We weren't, Jane assured him. We can't escape unless you'll help us. I was so glad when Kavanda Vanda said that you were to guard us. You know, you are the only friend we have, Ogley. Did you see how Kavanda Vanda looked at you, the man demanded, suddenly. Why no, not particularly, replied Jane. Well, I did, and I've never seen him look that way at a captive before. Neither did I ever know him to permit a person to stand before him without first kneeling. I believe that you have bewitched him, too. Did you like him, woman? Not as well as I like you, Ogley whispered the girl. He can't do it, exclaimed the man. He's got to obey the law the same as the rest of us. Do what? demanded Jane. If he tries it, I'll a noise in the corridor silenced him, and just in time. The door was swung open by a slave, and as he stood aside the figure of Kavandavanda was revealed behind him. As he entered the room Ogley dropped to his knees. Annette followed his example, but Jane remained erect. So you won't kneel, eh? demanded Kavanda Vanda. Well, perhaps that is the reason I like you, one of the reasons. You too may arise. Get out into the corridor, all of you except this one who calls herself Jane. I wish to speak with her alone. Ogley looked Kavanda Vanda straight in the eyes. Yes, he said. Yes, High Priest of the Priests of Kavuru, I go, but I shall be near. Kavanda Vanda flushed momentarily in what seemed anger, but he said nothing as the others passed out into the corridor. When they had gone and the door had been closed, he turned to Jane. Sit down, he said, motioning toward one of the benches, and when she had, he came and sat beside her. For a long time he looked at her before he spoke his eyes the eyes of a dreamer of dreams. You are very beautiful, he said, at last. I have never seen a creature more beautiful. It seems a pity, then, it seems a pity. What seems a pity, demanded the girl. Never mind, he snapped, brusquely. I must have been thinking aloud. Again, for a space, he was silent, sunk in thought, and then, what difference will it make? I may as well tell you. It is seldom that I have an opportunity to talk with anyone intelligent enough to understand, 
and you will understand you will appreciate the great service you are to render if I am strong. But when I look at you, when I look deep into those lovely eyes, I feel weak. No, no. I must not fail, I must not fail the world that is waiting for me. I do not understand what you are talking about, said the girl. No, not now, but you will. Look at me closely. How old do you think I am? In your twenties, perhaps. He leaned closer. I do not know how old I am. I have lost all track. Perhaps a thousand years, perhaps a few hundred, perhaps much older. Do you believe in God? Yes, most assuredly. Well, don't. There is no such thing, not yet, at least. That has been the trouble with the world. Men have imagined a God instead of seeking God among themselves. They have been led astray by false prophets and charlatans. They have had no leader. God should be a leader, and a leader should be a tangible entity something men can see and feel and touch. He must be mortal and yet immortal. He may not die. He must be omniscient. All the forces of nature have been seeking throughout all the ages to produce such a God that the world may be ruled justly and mercifully forever, a God who shall control the forces of nature as well as the minds and acts of men. Almost such am I, Kavanda Vanda, high priest of the priests of Kavuru. Already am I deathless, already am I omniscient, already, to some extent, can I direct the minds and acts of men. It is the forces of nature that yet defy me. When I have conquered these, I shall indeed be God. Yes, agreed Jane, bent upon humouring this madman, yes, you shall indeed be God, but remember that mercy is one of the characteristics of godliness. Therefore, be merciful, and set my companion and me free. And have the ignorant barbarians of the outer world swoop down upon us and rob mankind of its sole hope of salvation by destroying me? No. But what purpose can I serve? If you free us, I promise to lead no one here. You can serve the only purpose for which women are fit. Man may only attain godliness alone. Woman weakens and destroys him. Look at me. Look at my priests. You think we are all young men. We are not. A hundred reigns have come and gone since the latest neophyte joined our holy order. And how have we attained this deathlessness? Through women. We are all celibates. Our vows of celibacy were sealed in the blood of women, in our own blood will we be punished if we break them. It would be death for a Kavuru priest to succumb to the wiles of a woman. Jane shook her head. I still do not understand, she said. But you will. Long ago I learned the secret of deathless youth. It lies in an elixir brood of many things, the pollen of certain plants, the roots of others, the spinal fluid of leopards, and, principally, the glands and blood of women, young women. Now do you understand? Yes. The girl shuddered. Do not recoil from the thought, remember that you will thus become a part of the living God. You will live forever. You will be glorified. But I won't know anything about it, so what good will it do me? I shall know. I shall know that you are a part of me. In that way I shall have you. He leaned closer to her. But I should like to keep you as you are. His breath was hot upon her cheek. And why not? Am I not almost a god? And may not God do as he chooses? Who is there to say him nay? He seized her and drew her to him. 29. To what doom? It was almost dusk when Adeni led his captive through the village of the Kavuru and to the temple of Kavandavanda. By another trail Tarzan was approaching the clearing before the village. He paused and lifted his head. What is it? asked Brown. Is his Inus coming? inquired Tibbs. The ape man shook his head. We are nearing a village. 
It is the village of the Kavuru, but nearer still our friends, Waziri. How do you know? demanded Brown. Tarzan ignored the question, but motioned for silence, then from his lips came softly the call of the quail three times he voiced it. For a moment, as he stood listening, there was silence, then once, twice, thrice came the answering call. Tarzan moved forward again followed by his companions, and a moment later Muviro and Belando came running to drop to their knees before him. Very briefly and in sorrow Muviro told what had happened. Tarzan listened without comment. No emotion of either sorrow or anger was reflected by his expression. Then you think it impossible to gain entrance to the village, he asked. We are too few, Buana, replied Muviro, sadly. But if Buaira still lives, she is there, Tarzan reminded him, and your mem sahib and another white girl who belongs to this man. He gestured toward the American. Much that life holds for us three may be behind the gates of that village, and there is the memory of our slain friends. Would you turn back now, Muviro? Muviro follows where Tarzan leads, replied the black, simply. We will go to the edge of the clearing that you speak of, and there we may make our plans. Come. The ape man moved silently along the trail, followed by the others. As they came to the edge of the clearing, he halted. Brown smothered an exclamation of surprise. Well. In the name of. Say, do you see what I see? That's a ship. I forgot to tell you, said Muviro. Two men came in a ship and landed. The Kavaru killed them. You can see their bodies lying beside the ship. As Tarzan stood at the edge of the forest beyond the village of the Kavaru it was well for his peace of mind that he did not know what was transpiring in the temple of Kavandavanda on the opposite side of the village, for at that very moment the high priest seized Jane and crushed her to him. Helpless and hopeless, not knowing which way to turn for help, the girl acted upon what appeared an inspiration. Pushing the man's lips from hers, she raised her voice in a single piercing cry, Ogdly. Instantly the door of the apartment swung open. Kavandavanda released her and sprang to his feet. Ogdly crossed the threshold and halted. The two men stood glaring at one another. Ogdly did not ask why the girl had summoned him. He appeared to know. Kavandavanda's face and neck burned scarlet for a moment, then went deadly white as he strode past Ogli and out of the room without a word. The warrior crossed quickly to the girl. He will kill us both, now, he said. We must escape, then you will belong to me. But your vows, cried Jane, clutching at a straw. What are vows to a dead man, asked Ogli. And I am as good as dead now. I shall go and take you with me. I know a secret passage beneath the courtyard and the village. Thus sometimes goes Kavandavanda to search in the forest for secret flowers and roots. When it is dark, we shall go. As Kavandavanda strode through the corridors of his palace, his heart black with rage, he met a Denny coming with his captive. What have you there? he demanded. A Denny dropped to his knees. One of those into whose skull a demon has come to dwell. I have brought him to Kavandavanda. Take him away, growled the high priest, and lock him up. I will see him in the morning. Ideni rose and led Sporov on through the temple. He took him to the second floor and shoved him into a dark room. It was the room of the two snakes. Next to it was the room of the three snakes. Then Ideni shot a bolt on the outside of the door and went away and left his prisoner without food or water. In the next room Ogli was planning the escape. He knew he could not carry it out until after the temple slept. I will go away now and hide, he said, so that Kavandavanda cannot find me before it is time to go. Later I shall return and get you. You must take Annette, too, said Jane, the other girl. Where is she? In the next room. I put her there when Kavandavanda sent us out of this one. 
You will take her with us. Perhaps, he replied, but Jane guessed that he had no intention of doing so. She very much wished to have Annette along, not alone to give her a chance to escape the clutches of the high priest, but because she felt that two of them together would have a better chance of thwarting the designs of Ogley once they were in the jungle. Do not try to escape while I am gone, cautioned Ogley. There is only one way besides the secret passage, and that is across the courtyard. To enter the courtyard would mean certain death. He opened the door and stepped out into the corridor. Jane watched him close the door, and then she heard a bolt moved into place. In the room of the two snakes Sporov groped around in the darkness. A lesser darkness came from the night outside through the single window overlooking the courtyard. He went to the window and looked out. Then he heard what seemed to be muffled voices coming from an adjoining chamber. He prowled along the wall until he found a door. He tried it, but it was locked. He continued to fumble with the latch. In the next room Jane heard him and approached the door after Ogley left her. The warrior had said that Annette was in the next room, that must be Annette, she thought, trying to return to her. Jane found that the door was secured by a heavy bolt on her side. She was about to call to Annette when she realized that the girl evidently realized some necessity for silence, else she had called to Jane. Very cautiously she slipped the bolt a fraction of an inch at a time. Annette was still fumbling with the latch on the opposite side, Jane could hear her. At last the bolt drew clear and the door swung slowly open. Annette, whispered Jane as a figure, dimly visible in the gloom, came slowly into the room. Annette is dead, said a man's voice. Brown killed her. He killed Jane, too. Who are you? Alexis, cried Jane. Who are you, demanded Sporov. I am Jane, Lady Greystoke. Don't you recognize my voice? Yes, but you are dead. Is Kitty with you? My God, he cried, you have brought her back to haunt me. Take her away. Take her away. His voice rose to a shrill scream. From the door on the opposite side of the apartment came the sound of running, and then Annette's voice. Madam. Madam. What is it? What has happened? Who's that? demanded Sporov. I know, it's Annette. You have all come back to haunt me. Calm yourself, Alexis, said Jane, soothingly. Kitty is not here, and Annette and I are both alive. As she spoke she crossed the room to the door of the chamber in which the French girl was confined and, feeling for the bolt, drew it. Don't let her in, screamed Sporov. Don't let her in. I'll tear you to pieces if you do, ghost or no ghost. He started across the room on a run just as the door swung open and Annette rushed in. At the same moment the door leading into the corridor was pushed open, and the black slave, Medek, entered. What's going on here? he demanded. Who let that man in here? At sight of Annette, Sporov recoiled, screaming. Then he saw Medek in the dim light of the interior. Kitty, he shrieked. I won't go with you. Go away. Medic started toward him. Sporov turned and fled toward the far end of the room, toward the window looking out upon the courtyard. He paused a moment at the sill and turned wild eyes back toward the shadowy figure pursuing him, then, with a final maniacal scream of terror, he leaped out into the night. Medek followed him to the window and leaned out then from his lips broke the same horrid scream that Jane had heard earlier in the day as she was being led from the throne room of Kavandavanda. From below came the moans of Sporov, who must have been badly injured by the fall from the second-story window, but presently these were drowned by the snarls and growls of leopards. The two girls could hear them converging from all parts of the grounds upon the moaning creature lying out there in the night. Presently the sounds of the leopards rose to a hideous din as they fought over the flesh of their prey. For a few moments the screams of their victim mingled with the savage mouthings of the beasts, but soon they ceased. 
Medek turned away from the window. It is not well to seek escape in that direction, he said, as he returned to the outer corridor, closing the door behind him. How awful, madam, whimpered Annette. Yes, replied Jane, but his sufferings were mercifully brief. Perhaps, after all, it is just as well. His mind is gone. Prince Sporov had become a maniac. What a terrible price he paid. But is it not, perhaps, that he deserved it, madam? Who shall say? But we, too, are paying a terrible price for his greed and his wife's vanity. The thing she sought is here, Annette. What thing, madam? Not the restorer of youth. Yes. Kavanda Vanda holds the secret, but neither the princess nor any other could have gotten it from him. We should all have met a terrible fate just the same had the entire party succeeded in reaching the village of the Kavaru, the fate that is reserved for you and me. What fate, madam? You frighten me. I do not mean to, but you may as well know the truth. If we do not succeed in escaping we shall be butchered to furnish ingredients for Kavandavanda's devilish potion that keeps the priests of Kavuru always youthful. Essesha, madam, cautioned Annette, fearfully. What was that? I don't know. It sounded as though someone in the corridor had tried to scream. Then there was a thud, as though someone had fallen. Did you hear that? Yes, and now someone is trying the door. They are slipping the bolt. Oh, madam. Some new horror. The door swung open and a figure stepped into the room. A voice spoke. Woman. Are you there? It was the voice of Ogdley. I am here, said Jane. Then come quickly. There is no time to be lost. But how about the slave in the corridor? He will see us go out. The slave is there, but he will not see us. Come. Come, Annette. It is our only chance. The other woman is here, demanded Ogdley. Yes, replied Jane. And if I go, she must go. Very well, snapped the Kavuru but hurry. The two girls followed the man into the corridor. Across the doorway lay the body of Medek. The dead eyes were staring up at them. Ogley kicked the black face and gave a short laugh. He looks, but he does not see. The girls shuddered and pressed on behind the warrior. He led them cautiously along dark corridors. At the slightest sound he dragged them into pitch black rooms along the way until he was sure there was no danger of discovery. Thus, much time was consumed in nerve-wracking suspense. Ogdley advanced with evident trepidation. It was apparent that now that he had embarked upon this venture he was terrified, the shadow of Kavandavanda's wrath lay heavy upon him. The night dragged on, spent mostly in hiding as the trio made their slow way toward the secret entrance to the tunnel that led out into the jungle. Once more they crept on after a long period of tense waiting and listening in a dark chamber, then Ogli spoke in a relieved whisper. Here we are, he said. Through this doorway. The entrance to the tunnel is in this room. Make no noise. He pushed the door open cautiously and entered the chamber the two girls following closely behind him. Instantly hands reached out of the dark and seized them. Jane heard a scuffling and the sound of running feet, then she was dragged out into the corridor. A light was brought from another apartment, a bit of reed burning in a shallow vessel. Annette was there, close to her, trembling. They were surrounded by five sturdy warriors. In the light of the sputtering cresset the men looked quickly from one to another. Where is Ogdley? demanded a warrior. Then Jane realized that her would-be abductor had vanished. I thought you had him, replied another. I seized one of the girls. I thought I had him, spoke up a third. And so did I, 
said a fourth, but it was you I had. He must have run for the tunnel. Come, we'll go after him. No, objected the first warrior. It is too late. He has a good start. We could not catch him before he reached the forest. We could not find him there at night, agreed another. It will soon be daylight, then we can go after him. We'll see what Kavandavanda says when we take the women to him, said the first warrior. Bring them along. Once again the girls were led through the corridors of the temple this time to an apartment adjoining the throne room. Two warriors stood before the door. When they saw the girls and were told what had happened, one of them knocked on the door. Presently it was opened by a black slave, sleepily rubbing his eyes. Who disturbs Kavandavanda at this hour of the night, he demanded. Tell him we have come with the two white girls. He will understand. The black turned back into the apartment, but in a few moments he returned. Bring your prisoners in, he said, Kavandavanda will see you. They were led through a small antechamber lighted by a crude cresset to a larger apartment similarly illuminated. Here Kavandavanda received them, lying on a bed covered with leopard skins. His large eyes fixed themselves upon Jane. So you thought you could escape, he asked, a crooked smile twisting his weak lips. You were going to run off with Ogdly and be his mate, were you? Where is Ogdly? he demanded suddenly, as he realized that the man was not with the others. He escaped through the tunnel, reported a warrior. He must have thought Kavandavanda a fool, sneered the high priest. I knew what was in his mind. There are only six men beside myself who know about the tunnel. Ogdly was one of them, the other five are here. He was addressing Jane. I sent these five to wait at the entrance to the tunnel until Ogdly came, for I knew he would come. He paused and gazed long at Jane, then he turned to the others. Take this other one back to the room of the three snakes, he ordered, and see that she does not escape again. He indicated Annette with a gesture. This one I will keep here to question further, there may have been others concerned in the plot. Go! Annette cast a despairing look at Jane as she was led from the room, but the other could give her no reassurance nor encouragement. Their position seemed utterly without hope now. Goodbye, Annette. That was all. May the good God be with us both, madam, whispered the French girl as the door was closing behind her. So, said Kavandavanda when the others had left, you were going to run off into the jungle with Ogdly and be his mate. He was going to break his vow because of you. The shadow of a sneer curled the girl's lip. Perhaps Ogdly thought so, she said. But you were going with him, Kavandavanda insisted. As far as the jungle, replied Jane, then I should have found some means to escape him, or, failing that, I should have killed him. Why, demanded the high priest. Have you, too, taken a vow? Yes, a vow of fidelity. He leaned toward her eagerly. But you could break it, for love, or, if not for love, for a price. She shook her head. Not for anything. I could break mine. I had thought that I never could, but since I have seen you, he paused, and then, peremptorily, if I, Kavandavanda, am willing to break mine, you can break yours. The price you will receive is one for which any woman might be willing to sell her soul, eternal youth, eternal beauty. Again he paused as though to permit the magnitude of his offer to impress itself upon her. But again she shook her head. No, it is out of the question. You spurn Kavandavanda. His cruel mouth imparted some of its cruelty to his eyes. Remember that I have the power to destroy you, or to take you without giving anything in return, but I am generous. And do you know why? I cannot imagine. Because I love you. I have never known love before. No living creature has ever affected me as do you. I will keep you here forever, I will make you high priestess, 
I will keep you young through the ages, I will keep you beautiful. You and I will live forever. We will reach out. With my power to rejuvenate mankind, we shall have the world at our feet. We shall be deities, I, a god, you, a goddess. Look. He turned to a cabinet built into the wall of the apartment. It was grotesquely carved and painted, human figures, mostly of women, grinning skulls, leopards, snakes, and weird symbolic designs composed the decorations. From his loincloth he took a great key, hand wrought, and unlocked the cabinet. Look, he said again. Come here and look. Jane crossed the room and stood beside him at the cabinet. Within it were a number of boxes and jars. One large box, carved and painted similarly to the outside of the cabinet, Kavanda Vanda took in his hands. You see this, he asked. Look inside. He raised the lid revealing a quantity of black pellets about the size of peas. Do you know what these are, he demanded. I have no idea. These will give eternal youth and beauty to a thousand people. You are free to use them if you say the word. One taken each time that the moon comes full will give you what all mankind has craved since man first trod this earth. He seized her arm and tried to draw her to him. With an exclamation of repugnance she sought to pull away, but he held her firmly, then she struck him heavily across the face. Surprised, he relaxed his grasp, and the girl tore herself away and ran from the room. Into the antechamber she ran, seeking to gain the corridor. With a cry of rage, Kavanda Vanda pursued her and, just at the doorway leading into the corridor, he overtook her. He seized her roughly, tangling his fingers in her hair, and though she fought to extricate herself, he dragged her slowly back toward the inner apartment. 30. The Dead Men Fly Tarzan and Brown had talked late into the night in an attempt to formulate a feasible plan whereby they might gain entrance to the village of the Kavuru, with the result that the ape-man had finally suggested a mad scheme as the only possible solution of their problem. Brown shrugged and grinned. We could sure get in that way, of course, though it all depends. But how are we going to get out again? Our problem now, replied Tarzan, is to get in. We shall not have the problem of getting out until later. Perhaps we shall not come out. It really is not necessary that you come in with me if... Skip it, interrupted Brown. Annette's in there. That's enough for me to know. When do we start? We can't do much until just before dawn. You need rest. Lie down. I'll wake you in time. Tarzan slept, too, a little way from the others on the edge of the clearing where he had a view of the village. He slept in a low crotch a few feet above the ground, and he slept well, yet he slept lightly, as was his wont. The habitual noises of the jungle did not disturb him, but as the time approached when he must awaken Brown, he himself came suddenly awake, conscious of something unusual that disturbed the monotonous harmony of the forest. Alert and watchful, he rose silently to his feet, listening. Every faculty, crystal sharp, was attuned to the faint note of discord that had aroused him. What was it? Swiftly he moved through the trees, for now his sensitive nose had identified the author of the stealthy sound that his ears had detected a carvuru. Presently the ape man saw the dim figure of a man walking through the forest. He was walking rapidly, almost at a trot, and he was breathing heavily as one who had been running. Tarzan paused above him for an instant and then dropped upon his shoulders, bearing him to the ground. The man was powerful, and he fought viciously to escape, but he was wax in the hands of the lord of the jungle. The ape-man could have killed him, but the instant that he had realized that a Akavaru might fall into his hands, he had planned upon taking him alive, feeling that he might turn him to some good account. Presently he succeeded in binding the fellow's wrists behind him, then he stood him upon his feet. For the first time, his captive looked him in the face. It was still dark, but not so dark that the Kavuru could not recognize the fact that his captor was not one of his own kind. He breathed a sigh of relief. 
Who are you? he demanded. Why did you capture me? You are not going to take me back to Kavandavanda. No, of course not, you are not a Kavuru. Tarzan did not know why the man should object to being taken to Kavandavanda. He did not even know who Kavandavanda was, nor where, but he saw an opening, and he took advantage of it. If you answer my questions, he said, I will not take you back to Kavandavanda, nor will I harm you. Who are you? I am Ogli. And you just came from the village? Yes. You do not want to go back there? No. Kavandavanda would kill me. Is Kavandavanda such a mighty warrior that you are afraid of him? It is not that, but he is very powerful. He is high priest of the priests of Kavuru. By simple questions Tarzan had learned from the answers Ogli made enough to give him the lead that he desired to glean further information from his prisoner. What did Kavandavanda want of the two white girls that were taken to him, he demanded. At first he would have killed them, replied Ogli, willingly, for now he thought that he saw an opportunity to win mercy from this strange giant who was evidently interested in the two girls, but, he continued, he suddenly came to desire one of them for a mate. I tried to befriend them. I was leading them out of the village by a secret passage when we were set upon by several warriors. They recaptured the girls, and I barely escaped with my life. So the girls are still alive? Yes, they were, a few minutes ago. Are they in any immediate danger? No one can say what Kavandavanda will do. I think they are in no immediate danger, for I am sure that Kavandavanda will take one of them for a mate. Perhaps he already has. Where is this secret passage? Lead me to it. Wait until I get my friends. He led Ogli to where the others slept, and aroused them. I can show you where the passage is, explained Ogli, but you cannot enter the temple through it. The doors at either end open only in one direction toward the forest, for those who do not know their secret, and only Kavandavanda knows that. One may easily pass out of the temple, but it is impossible to return. Tarzan questioned Ogli for several minutes, then he turned to Brown. Annette and Lady Greystoke are in the temple, he explained. The temple is in a small canyon behind the village. If we gained access to the village we would still have a battle on our hands to reach the temple. This fellow has told me where I can expect to find the prisoners in the temple, he has also given me other valuable information that may be useful if we succeed in getting to Lady Greystoke and Annette. I believe that he has spoken the truth. He says, further, that one of the women is in grave danger at the moment I think it is Lady Greystoke, from his description, so there is no time to be lost. Then he turned to Muviro. Hold this man until Brown and I return. If we do not return before dark, you may know that we have failed, then you should return to your own country. Do, then, what you will with this prisoner. Give Brown and me the weapons that you took from the bodies of the flyers. They are of no more use to you, as you have exhausted the ammunition. Brown thinks we may find more in the ship. Come, Brown. The two men moved silently out into the clearing the ape-man in the lead. He bent his steps toward the ship, Brown treading close upon his heels. Neither spoke, their plans had been too well formulated to require speech. When they came to the ship, Brown immediately crawled into the forward cockpit. He was there for several minutes, then he entered the rear cockpit. While he was thus engaged, Tarzan was busy over the bodies of the slain aviators. When Brown had completed his examination of the interior of the cockpits, he descended to the ground and opened the baggage compartment, then he joined the ape man. Plenty of ammunition, he said, and handed Tarzan a full box of cartridges. That's about all you can manage, you ain't got no pockets. I've stuffed my pockets full, must weigh a ton. How about petrol, asked Tarzan. Not much more in a hatful, replied the American. Will it do? Yep, 
if it don't take too long to get warmed up. Got the chutes? Tarzan handed Brown a parachute that he had taken from the body of one of the flyers, the other he adjusted to his own body. They spoke no more. Tarzan climbed into the forward cockpit, Brown into the other. Here's hoping, prayed Brown under his breath as he opened the valve of the air starter. The answering were of the propeller brought a satisfied smile to his lips, then the ignition caught and the engine roared. They had waited for dawn, and dawn was breaking as Brown taxied across the rough plain downwind for the takeoff. He picked his way among boulders, choosing the best lane that he could find, but he saw that it was going to be a hazardous undertaking at best. When he reached the limit of the best going, he brought the nose of the ship around into the wind, set the brakes, and opened the throttle wide for a moment. The motor was hitting beautifully. Sweet, muttered the American, then he throttled down to idling speed and shouted ahead to Tarzan, if you know any prayers, buddy, you'd better say em all of em. We're off. Tarzan glanced back, his white teeth gleaming in one of his rare smiles. There was a rush of wind as Brown gave the ship full throttle. It was a perilous takeoff, swerving to miss boulders as the ship picked up speed. The tail rose. The ship bumped over the rough ground, tipped drunkenly as one wheel struck a small rock. A low boulder loomed suddenly ahead. It would be impossible to swerve enough to miss it without cracking up. Brown pulled the stick back and held his breath. The ship rose a foot or two from the ground. Brown saw that it was not going to clear the boulder. He could see but a single hope, a slim one, but he seized it instantly. He pushed the stick forward, the wheels struck the ground with a jarring bump, the ship bounced into the air as the stick helped to pull her up just enough to clear the boulder. She had flying speed by now and continued to rise slowly. It had been a close call, and although the morning air was chill, Brown was wet with perspiration as he climbed in a wide spiral above the forest. The village of the Carveru lay below snuggled against the foot of the high escarpment that backed it, but it was not the village in which the two men were interested it was the box canyon behind it where lay the temple of Kavandavanda of which Ogdli had told them. Higher and higher rose the graceful plain, watched from the edge of the forest by Muviro, Belando, Tibbs, and Ogdli, and now, awakened by the drone of the motor, by Carveru warriors congregated in the main street of the village. The dead men fly, whispered a warrior in awed tones, for he thought that the ship was being flown by the two who had brought it down and who had fallen before the attack of the villagers. The thought, once voiced, took root in the minds of the Kavuru and terrified them. They saw the ship turn and fly toward the village, and their fear mounted. They come for vengeance, said one. If we go into our huts they cannot see us, suggested another. That was enough. Instantly the street was deserted, as the Kavuru hid from the vengeance of the dead. Above the lofty escarpment and the towering cliffs Brown guided the ship. Below them lay the little valley and the temple of Kavandavanda, plainly visible in the light of the new day. The pilot cut his motor and shouted to Tarzan. Not a chance to land there, he said. Tarzan nodded. Get more elevation, and tell me when. Brown opened the throttle and commenced to climb in a great circle. He watched the altimeter. Before they had left the ground he had known the direction of the wind and estimated its force. At 2,000 feet he leveled off and circled the rim of the canyon to a point above the cliffs on the windward side. He cut his motor for an instant and shouted to the ape man. Stand by! Tarzan slipped the catch of his safety belt. Brown brought the ship into position again. Jump, he shouted as he brought the ship sharply into a momentary stall. Tarzan swung onto the lower wing and jumped. An instant later Brown followed him. 31. The Wages of Sin Kavandavanda's soft, youthful appearance belied his strength. Jane was no match for him, and though she fought every foot of the way, fought like a young tigress, he dragged her back into his inner apartment. I ought to kill you, you she-devil, 
he growled, as he threw her roughly upon the couch, but I won't. I'll keep you, I'll tame you, and I'll start now. He came toward her, leering. Just then a pounding sounded on the outer door of the antechamber, and a voice rose in terror, calling Kavanda Vanda. Kavanda Vanda! Save us! Save us! The high priest wheeled angrily. Who dares disturb Kavanda Vanda, he demanded. Get ye gone! But instead of going, those at the door flung it open and pressed into the antechamber to the very door of the inner room. There were both slaves and warriors in the party. Their very presence there would have told the high priest that something was amiss even without the evidence of their frightened faces. Now, indeed, was he impressed. What brings you here? he demanded. The dead men fly, they fly above the village and the temple. They have come seeking vengeance. You talk like fools and cowards, grumbled Kavandavanda. Dead men do not fly. But they do fly, insisted a warrior. The two that we killed yesterday are flying again this instant above the village and the temple. Come out, Kavandavanda, and cast a spell upon them, sending them away. I will go and look, said the high priest. Ideni, bring this girl along. If I leave her out of my sight, she will find some means to escape. She shall not escape me, said Ideni, and, seizing Jane by the wrist, he dragged her after the high priest, the warriors, and the slaves into the courtyard of the temple. The moment that they emerged from the building Jane heard plainly the drone of a ship's motor far above them. Looking up, she saw a biplane circling the canyon. With fascinated eyes the Kavaru were watching it, with fascinated, frightened eyes. Jane, too, was fascinated. She thought that the ship was searching for a landing place, and she prayed that the pilot might not attempt a landing here, for she knew that whoever was in the ship would meet instant death at the hands of the savage Kavaru. Then she saw a figure leap from the plane. A gasp of terror rose from the Kavaru. The first figure was followed by a second. They come, cried a warrior. Save us, Kavandavanda, from the vengeance of the dead. The billowing white shoots opened above the falling figures, checking their speed. They have spread their wings, shrieked a slave. Like the vulture, they will swoop down upon us. Jane's eyes followed the ship. As the second man jumped, it nosed down, then leveled off by itself, shot across the little canyon, came around in a steep bank, and went into a tail spin almost directly above them. Brown had opened the throttle wide at the instant that he jumped, for he and Tarzan had planned this very thing, hoping that the ship would crash near enough to the temple to cause a diversion that would enable them to reach the ground before warriors could gather below to receive them on the tips of sharp spears. But they had not anticipated the reality, the fear that gripped the Kavaru at sight of them and the ship. As they floated gently toward earth, a light wind carried them in the direction of the temple. They saw the crowd gathered in the courtyard looking up at them. They saw the ship diving with wide open throttle at terrific speed. They saw the crowd melt and vanish into the interior of the temple an instant before the plane crashed in the courtyard and burst into flame. Tarzan touched the ground first and had thrown off the parachute harness by the time Brown was down. A moment later the two men started for the temple at a run. There was no one to block their way. Even the guards at the outer gate had fled in terror. As they entered the courtyard, a few frightened leopards raced past them. The plane was burning fiercely against the temple wall a hundred feet away. Tarzan, followed closely by Brown, ran for the main entrance to the building. Even here there was none to dispute their right to enter the sacred precincts. At a distance they heard the sound of a babel of voices, and, guided by his keen ears, the ape-man hastened along corridors in the direction of these sounds. In the great throne room of Kavandavanda all the warriors and slaves of the temple were gathered. The high priest, trembling on his throne, was a picture of terror. The girls of the temple, those poor creatures who were awaiting death to give eternal life and youth to the Kavaru, were crouched at one side of the dais, 
wide-eyed and terrified. A warrior pushed forward toward the throne. An angry scowl darkened his painted face, made doubly hideous by the ivory skewer that passed through the septum of his nose. Many human teeth lay upon his breast, marks of his prowess as a hunter of girls. He pointed a finger at Kavandavanda. Your sins are being visited upon us, he bellowed. You would have broken your vow. We who prevented Ogli from taking the white girl last night know this. She bewitched him. She bewitched you. It is she who has brought the dead men upon us. Destroy her. Destroy her now with your own hands that we may be saved. Kill her. Kill her, shrieked a hundred hoarse voices. Kill her. Kill her, shrilled the fat, oily black slaves in their high falsettos. A couple of warriors seized Jane where she stood among the cowering girls and dragged her to the dais. They raised her roughly and threw her upon it. Still trembling, Kavandavanda seized her by the hair and dragged her to her knees. From his loincloth he drew a long, crude dagger. As he raised it above the heart of the girl a pistol barked from the doorway of the throne room, and Kavandavanda, high priest of the Kavora, seized his chest and, with a piercing scream, collapsed beside the girl he would have killed. Jane's eyes shot toward the doorway. Tarzan, she cried. Tarzan of the apes. A hundred pairs of other eyes saw him, too, saw him and Brown advancing fearlessly into the room. A warrior raised his spear against them, and this time Brown's gun spoke, and the fellow dropped in his tracks. Then Tarzan spoke, spoke to them in their own tongue. We have come for our women, he said. Let them come away with us in peace, or many will die. You saw how we came. You know we are not as other men. Do not make us angry. As he spoke, he continued to advance. The Kavuru, hesitating to attack, fearful of these strange creatures that flew down from the sky, that had been dead and were alive again, fell back. Suddenly Brown saw Annette among the other girls beside the dais. He leaped forward, and the warriors fell aside and let him pass. A great emotion choked the words from his throat as he took the girl in his arms. The ape man leaped to the side of his mate. Come, he said. We must get out of here before they have time to gather their wits. Then he turned to the girls huddled below. Is Bwira, the daughter of Muviro, here, he asked. A young black girl ran forward. The big Bwana, she cried. At last I am saved. Come quickly, commanded the ape man, and bring any of the other girls with you who wish to escape. There was not one who did not wish to leave, and Tarzan and Brown herded them from the throne room and toward the temple entrance but they had not gone far when they were met by rolling clouds of smoke and heard the crackling of flames ahead. The temple is afire, cried Annette. I guess we're in for it, growled Brown. It caught from the ship. Looks like we're trapped. Does anyone else know a way out? Yes, said Jane. There is a secret passage leading from the temple to the forest. I know where the entrance is. Come this way. She turned back and they retraced their steps toward the throne room. Soon they commenced to meet warriors and slaves. These slunk away into side corridors and apartments. Presently they reached the apartments of Kavandavanda. Jane was struck by a sudden thought. She turned to Brown. We all risked our lives, she said, and two of us died in a mad search for the secret of eternal youth. It is in this room. Do you care to take the few seconds it will require to get it? Do I? exclaimed Brown. And how? Lead me to it. In the inner room of the high priest's apartments, Jane pointed out the cabinet. There is a box in there that contains what you wish, but the key is on the body of Kavandavanda, she explained. I got a key right here, said Brown and, drawing his pistol, be fired a shot into the lock that shattered it, then he opened the cabinet. 
There, said Jane, pointing out the box that contained the pellets. Brown seized it, and they continued on in search of the tunnel's entrance. But presently Jane paused, hesitant. I am afraid we have come too far, she said. I thought I knew just where the tunnel was, but now I am all confused. We must find some way out of the temple, said Tarzan. The fire is spreading rapidly, following closely behind us. Smoke was already rolling down upon them in stifling volume. They could hear the ominous roaring of the flames, the crash of falling timbers as portions of the roof fell in, the shouts and screams of the inmates of the temple. A warrior, choking and half-blinded, stumbled into view from the dense smoke that filled the corridor along which they had come. Before the man could gather his faculties, Tarzan seized him. Lead us out of here, he commanded. That is the price of your life. When the fellow was able to open his eyes he looked at his captor. Tarzan of the apes, he exclaimed. Ideni, said the ape man. I did not recognize you at first. And you wish me to lead you out of the temple? You who have slain Kavanda Vanda, our high priest? Yes, replied Tarzan. If I show you the way through the village you will all be killed. The warriors of Kavuru are recovering from their first fright. They will never let you pass. I could lead you that way and let you be killed, but once you saved my life. Now, I shall give you yours. Follow me. He led the party a short distance down a side corridor and turned into a gloomy apartment. Crossing it, he pushed open a door beyond which was utter darkness. This tunnel leads out into the forest, he said. Go your way, Tarzan of the Apes, nor return again to the village of the Kavuru. Three weeks later a party of six was gathered before a roaring fire in the living room of Tarzan's bungalow far from the savage village of the Kavuru. The lord of the jungle was there, and his mate, Brown and Annette sat upon a lion's skin before the hearth, holding hands, Tibbs sat decorously on the edge of a chair in the background. He had not yet become accustomed to sitting on terms of equality with titled personages. Little Nkima, with far greater poise, perched upon the shoulder of a viscount. What are we going to do with this box of pills? demanded Brown. Whatever you wish, said Jane. You are willing to risk your life to get them. If I recall correctly, I think you said something to the effect that if you had them back in civilization they would make you lousy with money. Keep them. No, replied the American. We all risked our lives, and anyway you were the one that really got them. The more I think of it, the less I like my scheme. Most everybody lives too long anyway for the good of the world, most of them ought to have died young. Suppose Congress got hold of them, just think of that. Not on your life. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll divide them. There will be five of us that will live forever. And be beautiful always, added Annette. If you will pardon my saying so, miss, observed Tibbs with an apologetic cough, I should rather a dislike thinking of pressing trousers for so many years, and as for being beautiful, my word. I'd never get a job. Who ever heard of a beautiful valet? Well, we'll divide em anyway, insisted Brown. You don't have to take em, but be sure you don't sell none of em to no cab driver princes. Here, I'll divide em into five equal parts. Aren't you forgetting Kima? asked Jane, smiling. That's right, said Brown. We'll make it six parts. He's sure a lot more use in the world than most people. The End